everyone. The time is now 9.37 a.m. and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of May 14th, 2019 is called to order. The first item on the agenda is the approval of agenda and order of priority. Are there any item that the board members would like to add or delete from the agenda? I would like to request that we remove item S under the consent agenda and just have it as a separate item for, to vote on. It is a cri approval of criteria for 2018-23 Michigan Charter School Program Grant. Do we make that R? Um, then, I just want it to change remove our... from the consent agenda so that we vote on it separately. Oh, so you want to have, um, under the consent agenda, have two, have the consent agenda and then have a separate item to vote Correct. on. Correct. So what I, do I hear you say that instead of having it be a consent, that we would be voting on two items? Yes. Okay. Okay, so we would move then S to... R and change R to S. Yeah, oh, I see what you mean. Yes, yeah. it would become the new. It would become the R. new right. R. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and then change. <coughs> and then the consent yeah. agenda, agenda. just have S. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Which was the old R. Correct. Yes. Okay. We're actually just swapping those two and then moving the one to the discussion. Yep. Okay. Approval as amended of the agenda. Okay. Second. All right. So we have a motion to approve the agenda and order priority as amended. It has been moved and supported. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. <clears throat> okay, motion carries. Thank you. At this time, Marilyn will introduce members of the State Board of Education. Good morning. On my immediate left is the interim state superintendent, Sheila Alice. She's also chairperson of the board. And as we go around the table, the board's president is Cassandra Albrich, and she lives in Rochester Hills. Pamela Pugh is the board's vice president. Um, she may be joining us by phone this afternoon. She's from Saginaw. The board's secretary is Michelle Fecto. She resides in Detroit. Nikki Snyder is board member who resides in Dexter. Tiffany Tilly is the board's NASB delegate. It's their association, National Association of State Boards of Education. She resides in Southfield. This year's Teacher of the Year is Laura Chang. And when she's not with us, she's in Vicksburg Community Schools. She's a reading and math intervention specialist with K-5. And across the table is Josh Nayert. He's representing the governor at the board table. And Judy Pritchett is board member from Washington Township. Lupe Ramos-Montini, board member from Grand Rapids. Next to me is the board's treasurer, Tom McMillan. He lives in Oakland Township. I'm Marilyn Schneider. I'm the state board executive. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. And Scott, would you please begin the introduction of new employees? <clears throat> so it's my pleasure to introduce Kelly Cicillano Carter. Kelly um, is joining us as the director of the Office of Strategic Planning um, in implementation. She comes to us from the Michigan DNR where she has a wealth of experience and we've been, Kelly's been with us for about a month now, give or take, um, and is already doing fantastic work. So Kelly, would you like to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be working for Michigan Park Department of Education. I do have a lot of experience with the Department of Natural Resources. So um, in that role, I was there for 23 years. And I spent a lot of time working on communications as a communications director for the wildlife division and also working on stakeholder engagement and strategic planning. And Kelly stopped by my office yesterday evening on her way out to tell me how much she really loved and was enjoying being in the department. Thank you. Um, Kyle, would you please introduce your new staff members? Yes, we have a two today out of our division. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Carol Monroe in our office of financial management. Could, can you tell them about your role here in the department? I am a business It's also my pleasure to introduce Zach Gerard in our Office of uh, Health and Nutrition Services. Hello, pleasure to be here. Um, I am also a new government employee. Previously, I worked for three years at Morgan Stanley, 
as a um, financial operations and account manager, and uh, I got my Bachelor's of Arts from Michigan State University, as well as Ferris from Indiana University. I'm just Do we have any other new employees in the room today? All right, seeing none, then let's welcome our new employees to the department. <laughs> and would audience members please introduce themselves, starting with Marty Ackley. Hi, um, I'm Martin Ackley. I'm the director in the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs here at the Department of Education. Guard, Michigan Association Board. Bill Pearson, Director of Partnership Business, Officer. Good morning, Alicia. I'm the Superintendent in the College School District. Good morning, Paul Salah, Superintendent here on Valley Schools. Hello, Steve Ezekian, Deputy Uh, Phil Boone, I manage the state agency of finance. Labor, ground renew service. Tom Grant, Deputy Superintendent for Finance Operations here at the department. Scott Kenishnick, Deputy Superintendent for P20 System and Student Transition. Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent for uh, the Division of Educators and School Supports. Mark Howell, Superintendent's Office. Thank you, everyone. Again, welcome to the State Board of Education meeting. If you plan to offer public comment at today's meeting, please complete a form and get it to Marilyn. Forms are available on the table just outside of the boardroom, and then they must be submitted prior to the beginning portion of the meeting devoted to public comment. Public comment will begin immediately following the lunch break scheduled at approximately 1 p.m. today. Please be here on time to ensure that you have an opportunity to comment. The first item on the Committee of the Whole agenda is a presentation on school finance, the Michigan School Finance at the Crossroads, a quarter century of state control. We frequently read and hear that Michigan students rank near the bottom of the states, states on the National Assessment of Student Progress test. What we don't hear and read about much um, is that Michigan has the lowest growth of school funding nationally. So we should not be surprised that Michigan's rankings among states on the NAEP has fallen the past 14 years from about the middle of the states on the fourth and eighth grade tests to the bottom 25% of the states on the fourth grade reading and math tests and the bottom 35% of the states on the eighth grade reading and math tests. What is surprising is that Michigan students achievement on the NAEP has not fallen further behind other states considering that school funding in Michigan has been the lowest growth, has seen the lowest growth rate among all states. Academic research clearly shows that increased student funding improves student outcomes. In other words, money matters for student performance. This is a preview of what we are going to hear next. To to continue our series of presentations on school finance, this morning we are going to hear Dr. <coughs> David Arson, Michigan State University Professor of Education Policy, present highlights from the recent MSU report, School Finance at the Crossroads, a Quarter Century of State Control. During the Michigan School Business Officials Conference earlier this month, I had the pleasure of having dinner with Dr. Arson and also hearing him present findings from the MSU study on school finance and from the school, research, school Finance Research Collaborative and the implications that this has on uh, funding and student <coughs> outcomes for our state. So I'd like to welcome Dr. David Arson to the board table. We have a presentation. Dr. Arson, please come and join us. Dr. Arson, as I mentioned, is a professor at the College of Education at Michigan State University. And we will have a PowerPoint presentation. And Dr. Arson, we welcome you and we ask that you please introduce um, your colleague. colleague who is here with you. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you for taking up this important uh, policy issue for the state of Michigan. Um, this report uh, was written with two of my doctoral students, Tanner Delpier 
um, right here. Jesse Nagel as well, um, who uh, had another uh, obligation. He may be joining us during discussion. He's not allowed to walk in while we're I'll presenting. <laughs> I'll say that um, uh, uh, <coughs> among the things that were newsworthy in this report, just about all of them, Hannah and Jesse discovered. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I won't be able to do this forever, but there will be some very well-trained uh, uh, people to step in my shoes. They're both from Michigan. Tanner is from Marquette, um, uh, uh, and, and um, uh, uh, Jesse is from Ludington. They're um, Michiganders. They did all their K-12 in the state, as well as, as college, and now uh, in, 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 in economics, and now at policy at Michigan State for their doctoral students. So I've been very grateful for their help on this. And um, so I want to just build on something that the superintendent said. Um, Michigan schools are not doing as well as we'd like. Um, you mentioned the ranks in, in the NAEP, but actually it's it, in, in terms of the, the growth in, of, uh, uh, on, on, on proficiency uh, in the on reading and math, Michigan is 50th out of the 50 states in proficiency growth since 2003. And my comments today are intended to lay a foundation for improving on that fortunate record. Uh, Michigan has attempted to improve schools uh, with accountability and choice policies while ignoring funding um, uh, and trying to improve schools on the cheap. And we can now clearly see that it doesn't, uh, it hasn't worked. Let me say a couple words about this report. Um, we wrote the report with the goal of providing an intellectual foundation for addressing serious and durable uh, problems with Michigan school finance. We think it will be relevant for years. So if you haven't had a chance to read it yet, it, uh, we hope it will still be relevant during your summer reading. Um, we received no external funding for this research. Uh, we volunteered our time for it. Um, because uh, 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 education policy is increasingly an insider's game, sometimes policymakers themselves in the era of term limits don't know some of the details. And we, in, in, in addition, we're hoping to bring more Michigan citizens into the discussion, this important discussion. We, um, we wanted to make this report accessible. Right? We're not writing for professors. <coughs> Uh, and, and, and so to define some basic things like what does it mean to have a system that's equitable and adequate, um, uh, explain why even if you're not a big fan of, of state government, <laughs> that you have to have an active state role if you want equity and adequacy in school funding, um, and, and to provide some basics on, on how, how this system uh, works. So let me just say a few things. I imagine those of you at the table know a fair amount about Michigan's funding system. Let me just hit a few basic features, background, just in case to bring us uh, uh, up to speed. Our funding, current funding system was established in 1994 with the passage of uh, Proposal A. That, that uh, initiative had two main objectives. One was to substantially reduce property taxes, and the other was to reduce uh, the per-pupil funding gap between the top and the bottom funded districts. And it accomplished, it largely accomplished those two goals. Some other features. It created the foundation system that we have now, it, over time, the, the, the gap between the top and the bottom in the foundation allowances was narrowed by the state. Uh, nearly all now, as in compared to before Proposal A, nearly all the operational revenue moves with students when they moved from district to district or to charter schools. Um, and it sharply restricted the discretion of Michigan citizens, local districts and citizens, <coughs> to adjust their revenue uh, uh, by setting operating millages. Two key points. The foundation allowances from the beginning to this day were never calibrated to the cost of providing education services. Okay? That was never done. Okay? And secondly, Proposal A did not address school facilities. Okay? It was just too complicated in the time that they had available to them to try to bring that into it. And it has never been addressed since. So, 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 so we have a system where School operation funding is very, very centralized at the state level, whereas the 
funding for, for school facilities, very decentralized, totally funded by locally, local property taxes. Okay. Is this all familiar? <laughs> yeah, let's get it. All right, so how has this system worked? Um, what we're looking at here is a trend of all <laughs> revenues of Michigan schools. Okay, over the, from 1994, from the beginning of Proposal A, we're looking at federal, state, and local revenue. It includes ISDs, it includes charter schools, it includes funding for operations and for facilities from all sources. These data come from the National Center for Education Statistics, so they're comparable across all states. They're adjusted for inflation. Okay, and what you can see here is that in the early years, the first eight years, funding adjusted for inflation increased, uh, uh, but since uh, 2002, there's been a decline of roughly 30% in the inflation-adjusted funding for Michigan schools. If you adjust that for per pupil, it's a 22% decline, basically because our statewide enrollment has declined over this uh, uh, period. Okay. Right. If you just look at a subset of that total revenue, just the foundation allowances, so we're leaving off the, the facilities, we're leaving off a lot of other things, and of course the foundation revenue is very, very important for Michigan schools because this is the main source of their discretionary revenues for districts and charter schools, and you can see, again, these are adjusted for inflation. Um, uh, uh, to give you some idea, uh, uh, between 1995 and 2002, oh, and by the way, the, the, the state, as, as you might know, has different foundation levels. The basic was the target. Some districts were above, some districts below. Over time, the, 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 the gap between those has collapsed over time. If we just look at the basic, which was the target uh, foundation uh, for districts, between 1995 and 2002, the nominal basic foundation, that is to say, not adjusted for inflation, uh, increased by an average of $185 a year. But from 2003 to 2018, it increased by only $26 a year. The basic foundation increased by only $26 a year on average, which is substantially below the rate of inflation. So what we're looking at here are, are uh, once we adjust for inflation, we can see that since 2003, the inflation-adjusted basic foundation fell by 19%. The minimum foundation by 26%, and the hold harmless districts. The hold harmless districts are, are the high revenue districts from the very beginning. By the way, no districts have changed their rank order since 1994. Right? They're all in the same order in the revenue per pupil as they were back then. It's just that the gap between them has narrowed. So the very highest revenue districts back in 1994 are still the very highest revenue districts today, but they have had the sharpest decline, even the highest level. Because their increases have been so modest, they've had the sharpest decline in per pupil uh, in funding adjusted for inflation, a 40% decline over the entire period. Okay. Of course, districts that are losing enrollment have a specially hard challenge, right, because the, the, this is all calibrated to enrollment. I'll just say that none of these trends, uh, they, they all include the funding that districts use to pay for the MIPSERs. You understand? So that's money that, that, that they receive from the state, but that's not available to them for operations. If we had included them, we decided just to leave it in there, right? If we included the, the fall off in available revenues would be greater than what we're looking at here. Okay. So how does this compare to the rest of the states? Michigan is the red line. What we're looking at here is revenue in, total revenue in every year relative to the revenue in 1995. Okay, adjusted for inflation. Michigan is the red line. The other states are up there in, 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 in gray. Uh, and you can see, again, this is, this is using National, National Center for Education Statistics, so it's comparable. Um, between 1995 and 2015, uh, uh, Michigan was dead last in revenue growth. Uh, most of that decline, as you can see in the figure, came since 2002. Equally striking, is the gap between Michigan and the next lowest state, West Virginia, is spending 97% of its revenue in uh, level in 1995. Michigan is only 82%. Okay. No other state is close. Okay. So this is this is a, 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 the main. Uh, and I'll just say, when we went into this, we didn't know that would be the case. Tanner came back with that graph we were just looking at, and, and I just, you know, I, I was stunned to, to, see, to see that that's what, uh, what, what had happened. Um, so, 
So let's, let's carry on here. So this is the, that was the overall revenue trajectory. Um, uh, the other thing, that it, once, once the state <coughs> assumes control for funding, one of its principal obligations, in, 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 in addition to maintaining the overall uh, growth of revenue with inflation costs, is adjusting that revenue for cost uh, that district in, in, the, in the variations in the cost of providing services to different students. Um, and on this count, uh, Michigan has really, there's been a, a profound failure. It was not a feature of Proposal A, and the state has consistent, unfortunately, consistently ignored it once it had control over the funding allocation. So, so what we're looking at here is, just to take one example, uh, at-risk students. Uh, this is a categorical grant that were uh, designed to uh, uh, support services for high-need students, Section 31A. Funding is earmarked for vulnerable at-risk students, including those living in poverty, victims of child abuse, or whose parents are incarcerated or substance abusers. The number of at-risk students has increased significantly in Michigan. Yet, despite growing student need, Section 31A funding has declined sharply. A, over a 60% decline adjusted for inflation from its peak in 2001. Let me just mention, when Proposal A passed, the state hoped there was a goal that the foundations for at-risk students would be bumped 11.5%. Understand? So additional to, to cover this. Um, that's low for the additional cost for, for, for at-risk students. But over time, the funding didn't keep pace with that because the, the Section 31A, in addition to the growth in the number of students who are at risk, um, it didn't keep pace. And so we were in the vicinity of a bump for, for at-risk kids of about 5 6%. Okay, so really it's, it's almost as if at-risk kids almost didn't matter in terms of the additional funding that they received from the state. Of course, um, let me just mention another important area for, for, uh, for, for um, high-risk, high-need kids is special education. When the federal, the, the, the federal government establishes the guidelines for, um, for uh, student rights and, and the Individual Disability Education Act, it established, when it was passed, it established a goal for the federal government to pay 40% of the special education cost. That never happened. <laughs> um, the it, Congress only covers, the U.S. government covers about 10% of those costs. It relieves the rest to the states. Okay, and so different states decide, make different decisions on how they're going to, to fund these, these special education costs. No state is stingier than Michigan in funding these special ed costs. Okay. Michigan, Michigan is, most states use a weighted formula for special ed, you know, with different ways for severity of, of the disability. We don't. We, we are one of five states that uses a percentage reimbursement system. That is to say, once those costs are incurred, the approved costs are incurred, the state will reimburse a percentage of them. The percentage that is reimbursed, you can see it up here, is 28% of the approved special education costs. For most of, that's most of it. There's a little bit higher uh, uh, for special ed transportation. That 28% is the lowest of any of the five states that reimburse special education costs. Wyoming, by comparison, reimburses 100%. <laughs> um, so what, what happens here is that basically we got the feds paying for 10% special education. States, uh, the state is kicking in about 30%. It means 60% of the cost of the required special ed services are covered at the local level. Okay? Here's the problem. The local districts can't raise their millage rates under Proposal A. If the local districts, if, if an ISD will pick up this cost, that's terrific for the local <laughs> districts and the charter schools. But ISDs vary dramatically in their ability to cover this because they have very different taxable value per pupil. Okay? So they can only use a property tax, only can use a, 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 a special ed millage. You can see down here at the bottom, Genesee ISD, to give an example, has $144,000 per pupil in taxable value. Charlevoix Emmett has $600,000 in taxable value per pupil, which means that Genesee would have to levy four times as many mills to generate the same per pupil revenue as Charlevoix Emmett. Okay? In addition, so great inequalities in the, the, the state shifts the responsibility to the local level, but they're very unequally situated in, in carrying this burden. In addition, 
I'll have to say I didn't even know this startling fact until this guy right over here, Steve Ezekiel, enlightened me that huh, ISVs are capped at the, at the millage rate that they can assess. And that millage rate varies across ISDs based on the millage, the special ed millage rate that they were applying in 1995. Terrific variations in what ISDs can even assess. This is just <laughs> neglect to not address this kind of uh, uh, thing in our, in our system. So terrific variations as a result, as a result of this. Okay. Districts across Michigan and charters are devoting a substantial amount of their general education funding to covering their special education costs. On average, Michigan districts are devoting <coughs> over $500 a year of general education revenue to pay for required special education services. In some districts, it's over $1,200 <coughs> a year to cover these costs. Facility funding, not covered in Proposal A, and this creates unequal uh, uh, opportunities for students and unequal tax burdens for taxpayers. I'll just mention here, these, these bullets all correspond to peer review research. These facilities matter for student achievement for, for preparation. Some kids in Michigan are working with computer-controlled machine tools in their schools. They're getting prepared for things that other students just don't have access to. They may know they matter for teacher turnover, after-school arts and recreation, and so forth. They matter for citizens. They ma the realtors care about them. Okay. Here's the issue. It's all funded by local property taxes, and here's the original sin. Those local communities have terrific inequalities in their ability to pay. If you set out to design a system to fund Michigan school facilities that guaranteed that inequalities in the size and quality of homes that children live in would be reproduced in the schools that they go to and spend their school days in, you would pick the system that we have had. It guarantees that result. To give you an example, this is a simple example. We just picked four Michigan school districts. Um, we picked them uh, because they have roughly the same enrollment, about 2,000 students, okay? You can see that they, they differ in their taxable value per pupil, okay, from, from Carrollton at the bottom to Ludington at the top. You can see their total taxable value. And the question here is how much would it cost these communities to build the exact same elementary school in each of these communities? So this would be a 400 student elementary school, cost $20 million, pay it over 20 years. The cost to these communities would vary terrifically. 22 mills in Carrollton as opposed to 1.47 mills in Ludington, okay? How much would that be for a taxpayer on the far right, okay? These are terrific inequalities, not only for the students, but for the taxpayers. This is not fair. By the way, Carrollton could not build this school. It cannot build this school, even if the taxpayers were willing to assume this burden because that millage rate of 22 mills is way over the limit of 13 mills that they're set at. Okay. Meanwhile, Ludington is not at the top of the heap. There are districts with twice as much taxable value per pupil as them. All right. There are ways we know how to address this problem. Right? We know, in fact, we, 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 we discuss it in the report. This has just been neglected. It just hasn't been a priority for Michigan. Okay? We address this question, why has this happened? Why has the real revenue declined? We were focused in our report on two explanations. The first of these is the one that's been in the news. The one that the governor's talked about that's been, I mean, that is the transfer of funds from the, from the school aid fund to the general fund. It matters, it's important. But we want to also to, to, to note the second feature is a decline in tax effort. 
And between the two, the decline in tax effort is the more fundamental problem. The transfer of revenues from the school aid fund to the general fund is a symptom of the decline in tax effort. If you don't know, the state has two major funds, the general fund, the school aid fund. The discretionary revenue in the general fund is smaller than the school aid fund. The school aid fund is about over $13 billion. The general fund is about $10 billion. The general fund, though, has declined. It's, it's, it's a stunning decline of about a third in inflation-adjusted dollars since 2000. Okay? And those adjustments in the general fund have had an impact on the school aid fund. Okay? Um, if we could go ahead. Those, not everybody realizes that right from the beginning, the money that was under proposal aid dedicated to that school aid fund, you know, the increase in the, in the in sales tax of two percentage points and, <coughs> and other, other dedicated revenues, they were never enough to fund the foundations that the, that the legislature was promising school districts and charters. Okay? So right from the beginning, the legislature was transferring money from the general fund to the school aid fund to make it go. And on average, it was $560 million a year for the first eight years, or $5 billion over that period when the revenues were increasing for the state as a whole. Over time, reductions in the general fund made those transfers impossible, and they dried up. And in more recent years, the transfers have essentially gone in the other direction, as things that were formally funded in the, by, the, by the general fund are now funded from the school aid fund, primarily community college and higher education. So if you adjust all these revenues over time here, you can see the trend over this period. It's a swing of $1.2 billion annually in revenue for K-12, okay. about $850 per pupil. Okay. Um, if we can, but I'm saying that this is, while this has happened, it's a symptom of a more fundamental, more basic issue. And this is the tax effort issue. Okay, so, so tax effort, uh, economists define this as the share of income, or if you like, the share of an economy that's devoted to state and local government services. Okay, so this figure up here uh, actually comes from my colleague Charlie Ballard in the economics department at MSU. Um, we see that the, the, the U.S. as a whole is in the black line and Michigan is in the green. So what we're looking at here is the share of, 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 of personal income that's devoted to state and local taxes. And you can see that for the nation as a whole, this has been going down for, for, for decades. Okay? Um, uh, uh, Michigan in 1972 was above the national average. Uh, now we're below the national average. Okay? If we were just, consider this just for a moment, it's, it's kind of mind boggling. <laughs> If we were devoting the same share of our income today, the state and local government services as we did in 1972, that would be $15 billion more in state and local government revenue. That's more than all the revenue that's currently being spent in the school aid fund. If we were just, at now moving to, to at the other end, if we were just taxing ourselves at the national average, tax effort at the national average, it would be additional $3 billion. That would be enough to make up the shortfall since 1995. Let's consider just because, let's, uh, so here, here, here we have the, the, the tax effort. So some have said, well, well Michigan's fallen down because, because we had that great recession, but that's not so. You can see that after the great recession, what we're looking at here is the share of our income that's devoted to K-12 education Okay, it just dropped precipitously after the conclusion, as the economy is growing, as the state economy is growing, we're, we're devoting a progressively smaller share of our income to state and local. So if we just now keep going, thank you. Here's, this is the, the, the black line is the same figure we've seen before. And we're asking, how would that revenue trend differ if we were devoting the same share of our income or the state economy to K-12 education as we did just in 2007, not that long ago. If we devoted the same share of our income to K-12 education today as we did in 2007, it would generate an additional $6 billion. All right. 
Have you all been schooled in adequacy studies? You all know what they are. Should we take a moment to talk about this? Um, I'm not seeing any head nods. Did you see any? <laughs> it can't hurt. <laughs> all right. School finance adequacy studies are designed to address these kind of problems that we're talking about. They're designed to link the resources that schools receive to the outcomes expected by the state. By definition, these studies are aiming to, to combine both equity and efficiency. They've been conducted in lots of states. Um, if you, if you uh, don't know, the idea here of cost, that's, it, it has a formal definition. It's not just whatever schools spend. Right? Cost, by definition, is the minimum funding necessary in order to achieve a given education outcome. Like, like perform, giving up to the state's proficiency standards. It requires that schools are using best practices. That is to say, it requires, the economic definition of cost is the minimum that you need to spend if you're using the best practices, if you're as efficient as possible, to reach the state outcome expect expectation. By definition, variations in costs across districts are due to factors outside of local districts or charter schools control. It's a conceptual, it's a hypothetical thing. We can't read it directly off the budget statements of districts or state administrative data. You have to estimate it. There are many ways to estimate it. Uh, so any of these studies, they attempt to, first they have to say what constitutes an adequate education. Usually it's going to, not in, in the present day, it's, it's what the state standards have been set at. And then the, this is two-step process. What's the, how much does it cost for a typical student? And then secondly, how much does that variation, how much does that basic cost vary across districts uh, due to district and, district, district and student characteristics? Let me just say a word about Michigan's 2018 adequacy study. Okay. <coughs> important step. Um, I, I, some people have, have gotten confused about this because I've been talking about it. I was not, had no role in the school finance adequacy study. Okay. Uh, I, I was not invited. <laughs> I didn't receive an email, no phone calls. I thought, okay. <laughs> um, but both of the major consultants that bid on this, on the work to do this adequacy study asked me to participate in their, in their bids on the, on the research, and I said no. And the reason was that I wanted to be in a position after it was done to evaluate it and to comment on it. Um, and by the way, I didn't read, that thing was it released in January a year ago. I didn't get, a, maybe like one or two of you, I didn't get around to reading those 300 pages until seven months later in July last year after all this other research that we put up here was already done. And we figured, okay, well, we ought to see what they said. And I had, we had a few questions, and, um, and so then I had to start sort of sending emails off to the people who did the research, Bob Moore and, and, and the research, and, and, and they just sort of gave us an avalanche of information. And so we studied it. And we have to say, I'll say this. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say this with confidence. This is the best school finance adequacy study that I have ever seen. Okay. It's very high quality. Um, and... Uh, 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 the, the, the people did the research, top notch, uh, it was very careful, the best methods that I've, I've, I've been familiar with. Let me just, so, so um, let, and the first study to include charter schools, you've probably seen this, right? So I'm not going to take my time right now to go over these, these, these individual things, other than to say, I, we can come back to it if you like. Um, the base cost looked about right to us, that $9,500, the pupil weights, definitely the way to go. Notice, notice that, that poverty weight of 0.35. That, that's about right from what the research is telling us. Recall how, how much higher that is than what we're currently doing, or even when proposal A first passed at 11.5%. The, the adjustments for, for English language learners, for special education, these are all weights on that base cost for, for higher cost kids. I'll just say that the, the special education uh, weights looked about right to us. We differed with this study on a number of things including those special education uh, weights. 
Not only beca not because we're <laughs> thinking those are not accurate rec reflections of the cost of special education, but because we wanted to have districts and charters to have some skin in the game. If they're reimbursed at 90% of those costs, they won't have an incentive to over-identify. Going down the list, we'll just say that that preschool, early childhood education for, for four-year-olds uh, uh, and, and three-year-olds, we know that's a, that, that is a extremely cost-effective investment. $1,400 a kid, that's a lot of money, but it's money that's well spent. Okay, we differed on some things. The regional cost of living adjustment. We differed on 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 on, on the on, on on the school size. We can talk about that. We think there's more need for for additional study on on, on transportation, on high need poverty, on, on on career and technical education, and of course, on facilities. They did not talk about facilities. Okay, let's just jump ahead. I'm wrapping up. The the um, School Finance Research Collaborative did not put a price tag on this. They said, this is what it would cost for individual districts. Right? But they didn't say, well, what would, the, what would it cost for the state? Well, we're academics. We, we wanted to know. And so, um, so here's the answer. Um, it would cost uh, 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 between 3 and $4 billion. Okay, about $3.6 billion to implement these studies, including the early childhood education and all, all these, the base cost and the rest. Okay? And you might say, okay, that's a lot of money. What we're looking at here is Michigan's actual revenue trajectory, a line that you've seen already. To implement that study would cost about, the recommendations, about $22 billion. Okay? If we were taxing ourselves, if we had the same state tax effort as 2007, we would have nearly $2 billion more than is necessary to implement the recommendations of the School Finance Research Collaborative. Let me say, those recommendations are well-resourced schools. They're defined in terms of the class size, the counselors, the social workers, the after school. They're defined in terms of the services with salaries constant. These are well-resourced schools. We know they make a difference. They're, they're schools that every Michigan parent would want to have for their children. Some Michigan schools have a close approximation. to Some Michigan schools are in this ballpark. <laughs> Most are not. Let me just say that on this, we have, I'm going to just glide over this. It's just it's a slow. Just, let me direct your attention because in the interest of time, uh, 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 you know, there, there's a short-run strategy and a long-run strategy. The governor's executive budget, uh, uh, I think, um, to her credit, takes steps in the right direction. This is in the short run. Longer term, we provide a full set of recommendations in Section 9 of this report. That we think that if they are implemented, they will establish a foundation for a high-performing uh, education system. That, that top 10 in 10 will need a funding component has to have a funding component. We advance an argument, we'll stand behind it, that, that, that the funding recommendations in Section 9 of this report will establish a, a, a sound foundation for where Michigan wants to go in terms of the teaching and learning. It will re, it, a lot of the recommendations overlap with the School Finance Research Collaborative recommendations. Not all of them. We have some additional ones besides them. It will require additional revenue. Here's the key point here. In thinking about additional revenue, let's be clear about one thing. And this is, this is longer term discussion. This isn't this current budget cycles discussion. This is going to take a few years to resolve. Right? We're going to need some more revenue. We want high quality K-12. We want good <coughs> state universities. We want roads that are, are well maintained. We want clean water. It's going to require additional revenue. Here's something that, that I just ask you to, I just ask you and other policymakers to keep in mind. Michigan today is richer than it's ever been. GDP per capita is higher today in Michigan than it's ever been. Median, uh, the, the, it's 13% higher today than in uh, uh, 1999. But the median family income adjusted for inflation is not higher. It's lower. It's, it's declined. It's 9% below 1990. 
This means, this tells us, that there's been a terrific increase in income inequality in Michigan, like the rest of the country. If you take these facts and our values, we say that high-income households in Michigan should take the lead in restoring tax revenues. We have to think about tax revenues that will, will, will solve this problem by drawing uh, uh, according to the basic principle of ability to pay. That's fair. Okay? One option is a graduated income tax. It's only one. Okay? There are others. We could, we could, we could fix the, 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 the property tax so it, it is more progressive with the big circuit breaker. There's a lot of options. We could take it. Could... I think this might be the time, Tanner, do you agree, for me to stop talking <laughs> and make way for Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Arson. We'll now open it up to questions and comments from board members. Tom? Um, so I was, I was curious about the facilities inequality. So are you also saying that for charter schools, they should be able to get a millage, or is inequality for those kids OK? It is a fundamental problem. Thank you for that good and important question. So if you don't know, um, uh, Michigan charters, they cannot, they, they, they cannot levy uh, millages for, for anything. Right? They don't have, they don't have uh, catchment areas. And so charter schools have to pay for their facilities out of their foundation funding. Okay? So that's, a, that's a, a financial disadvantage for charters. Um, you know, the districts will say, well, well we're, we're putting money into, we're devoting some of our foundation to, to, the, to the MIPSers for the retirement, for transportation. The charters don't do that. But the, on the, the flip side is that the charters are paying for their facilities. Out of, uh, uh, out of the um, uh, foundation funding. And, and so, I mean, between the two, those are, are largely offsetting uh, sources. But, but we are with you, if, if I follow the spirit of your, of your suggestion, saying that the state really should step up and provide facility funding for charters. Okay. Not that they should be able to levy millage, but that no, they should no, have. No, no, okay. no. That um, there should be. So, okay. so in, in our, in our well, char I don't, I don't want to just put um, this portion of the report uh, Tanner took the lead on. I mean, we are, we are arguing for, for a twofold, um, you know, on, on the one hand, to, to overcome the, the, uh, the inequality across districts, a guaranteed tax base approach to the, to the uh, 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 facility funding for the state, okay? which, is, which Michigan had before Proposal A. And as it, so that leaves, that leaves the decision at the local level. About how much to spend, and so on, but it just equalizes the amount of, of revenue that different districts will generate per pupil uh, uh, with a given millage. You understand? Yep. So, so, it, so, so, and at, so that would be one piece. And the other piece is because charters are, have this handicap, we would say that, that there should be facility funding for charters, okay? Mm -hmm. And that in order to do that, we, you know, we need additional information. We need to do a, a state study on facilities. We need to do, it should include the charters. It should include the funding arrangements that they currently have because in most instances, many, many charters in Michigan, are, uh, the facilities are being provided by their management companies and they rent from the management companies. And we have very imperfect information on, on that at, the, at, the, mm -hmm. at the current level. And so we would, and, and, and it also creates, you know, a, a lock-in effect. So in many cases, because, for, for charters, that, that at least in, in our view, is, is, is not ideal. That is okay. to say, that the, the charter has to, has to turn to, it, it, the, the building is owned by the management company. Sometimes there's been public criticism about whether the rent that the management company is charging the charter is above market and so forth. I, I, we, we don't, you know, we, we need better data on this. But the, but the key thing here is that it's hard for a charter board to say no to a management company if they, if they okay. own the building. I understand. But your, your chart talked about capital millages, so you're okay with charters not being able to do a capital millage. The inequality there is okay. No, um, no, no. Of, no, the, six no. Of, I, I, of, of I, the six of the ten states that improved their average test scores on the NAEP the most, uh, they, were in the, they, were, they increased their funding the smallest uh, 11, you know, of all the 11 of the smallest increases came from those states, uh, or 10 of those states were in the, the bottom 11 as far as increased funding. So it doesn't necessarily correlate, is all I'm saying. And then 
the cherry picking of the inflator is really disturbing to me. I, I understand graphs and how you can manipulate them. If you use the CPI, actually the funding has gone up uh, completely as opposed to using a, an inflator that is actually tied to healthcare costs during that time, which is, I mean, I can, I can find, anybody can find an inflator to do whatever they want to show. And you guys certainly show, picked one that shows uh, unfairly, I think, um, you know, the decrease. It, like I said, if you would have picked the CPI, your whole argument would be different. So let me, if I could, um, maybe I, I, I don't know if I should take time to repeat what I said, but I'm not okay with the current way that Michigan funds charter facilities. No, 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 I'm totally changing. I, so, I switch. So I just, I, no, I, I, switch. If I understood what you no, said. No, I'm, I'm totally so, off so of the charter me, thing. So I'm now me, just saying, the whole argument that funding has gone down was inflation, quote unquote inflation adjusted, but that um, inflator that you guys chose is tied to healthcare costs. It's not a CPI. If you just chose CPI, the whole graph would be up instead of down. That's not true. It so, is true. Well, um, so, so it, um, it is. Sorry. You have two points here one that money isn't, is, is poorly correlated. Right, with growth. outcome. Right. Okay, so I can address That's that factual. if you like. And this second question about the um, price deflator. Um, the, um, has anybody here heard of the Mackinac Center? <laughs> You're condescending, you know, the way you talk is a little condescending. Um, so, you could just kind of so, talk um, normal. So um, the Mackinac Center has latched onto this question of the price deflator. Um, you know, um, and, I, I, and by the way, I refer you to the report itself where we describe the merits of the CPI and the price deflator that we use. Sure. Um, I'll just say that Ben DeGroo, the Mackinac Center's um, policy expert, um, we don't, you know, in academic settings, we don't really respond to these kind of things. Uh, they, they sort of lack legitimacy. Ben um, has no formal training in this turf, no economics training, no public policy training, no education training. So he lacks independent authority. Um, he only gets a job at a place where he has to say what his employer wants him to say. To me, it's kind of silly and demeaning to engage in, in this kind of um, uh, uh, ex exchange. What I'll say is that all the numbers in our report, we stand by them. <coughs> they have, I mean, rather than say, how much more does it cost to educate a poor kid? Say, what's happened with the tax effort in Michigan? Say about. They have tried to focus attention on this price deflator question. The price deflator that we use is the correct price deflator. Okay. The CPI, if your question, in all due respect, uh, uh, trustee, trustee McMillan, did you go to the your website said you studied economics at the University of Michigan? Is that correct? Um, yeah. My, I did too. <laughs> I was an undergraduate major in economics at the University of Michigan. My wife is an economist at the University of Michigan. You might know that at the University of Michigan, rather, I will say this, rather than getting in the shouting match with the Mackinac Center, I'm just nobody, talking facts. Nobody, I don't know nobody, why you have to talk about so, I never even brought them up. I'm just talking facts. They, well, CPI they, versus the cherry picked inflator you use. Totally it's not a cherry result. picking. Yeah. Um, so, in peer reviewed research on this turf, if your question is what, is, what is the purchasing power of state and local governments, you have to use the correct inflator. Right. The CPI is not the correct deflator. The University of Michigan, so we turn to, rather than getting the shoddy match, we turn to the top authority on this question in Michigan. 
One would be my colleague, uh, Charles Ballard, who said, I would have used exactly the same methodology the MSU study used. I would have used the BEA <coughs> deflator for state and local government. The foremost authority on this question in Michigan, arguably in the country, is an economist uh, 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 at the University of Michigan, Matthew Shapiro. He said the deflator for state and local government purchases is the official price index that best captures the price changes for purchases of state and local governments. We use the correct deflator. But here's the thing. This is why this is a total red herring. It doesn't matter what price deflator you use. Use the CPI. Don't deflate at all. Michigan is still dead last, 50 out of 50 states. Okay, thank you. Nikki, did you have a question or comment? A few. You're a youper, you said? Yeah. Nice work. So um, I just have a few questions. I, th I thought I heard you say from Marquette, so I just wanted to say that. Um, I feel like it's hard to have these conversations because there's some personal attacks happening with who's qualified, who's not. What does it mean to have a PhD? What does it mean to not? Um, but I don't, I don't think we need to go there. I think we should stay away from those types of attacks. I just have a few questions about federal funding and then also um, the concept of enrollment, because that is something we just interviewed a lot of our superintendents about, and um, they all kind of agreed with the high-risk funding, you know, funneling where it's needed most. So I think that's a general idea we mostly accept. But enrollment decreasing by 30% since 2002, and then we, we did have some data on how we're dead last as a state. Do you have any data on other states' enrollment? Is it also increasing in comparison to ours? Like, what are other states' enrollment in comparison to ours? Is that a factor that we should consider, and have you considered it? I understand the question. So Michigan's enrollment. Let me, re let me rephrase it. So our enrollment has declined, right? We know that this is a factor. It's something that we've all considered as very, very important. You talked about how since 2002, our um, Funding has gone down 30%. Uh, you talked about enrollment. Then we looked, as we compare state to state funding, are we also comparing state to state enrollment? I'm just curious about what that looks like. If we consider ourselves dead last in funding, which we do, where, and we consider the factors as to why, I'm just curious about enrollment in other states. So what does that look we like? We saw a, a slide up here. Um, and. Uh, it showed, it showed that, um, uh, that adjusting for enrollment. So the way, the way it's true, Michigan's total enrollment has declined. Other states, it varies. But we're, we're, we're you know, and that will affect the per pupil. So as we showed up here, the decline in revenue for per, per, for per pupil is less sharp. It's 30% versus 22% uh, for per pupil. If you just look at per pupil revenue, and compare across states, Michigan is still dead last since 2003. So did you answer my question about like when we consider how it's decreased and we say enrollment is a factor, why would we only look at Michigan's enrollment but not other states? That's, I'm just well, curious. If all states are, are, the way one would do that is by, by adjusting per pupil for every state. Okay, if you're saying, and, and, and we mentioned this in our report, okay, so we mentioned this in our report, but we, we didn't put another graph in there to, to, show, the, the, to show the trend on, on per pupil. But, but Michigan is still last uh, in, in per pupil. So then the other question I have about um, federal funding is when you look back at 1994, did you consider I mean, the increase in federal funding as well? over time. Did you increase your federal funding when you adjusted all of this? Because so it has all, increased significantly all overall. All of the, 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 the NCS data that we present here include federal funding. 
They're all, they're all in there. As, as I mentioned, it includes federal, state, local, except when we were, the, the, the figure where we were looking at specifically for um, foundation funding or Section 31A funding, those would not include. Okay. okay. So, so I, I, I think we, we, we did that. Okay. I thought the last time we met at the table, we weren't sure about those questions. Anything else, Nikki? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> we'll we, we might come back to you. Okay. <laughs> Michelle? Yeah. And then um, Tiffany. I thank you for your work. Um, I uh, particularly appreciate the um, attention to um, special education and, and those concerns of underfunding uh, as well. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to, um, when we talk about um, the de decrease in the effort and the tax effort, um, I, I know there was a big tax cut in 2011, um, and that has, oh, I'm so sorry, no. I'm like <laughs> rubbing that, I, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, um, I'm making static noise. Um, uh, so uh, I, I was looking at the implications of that, but I'm also, being from Detroit, I see these massive tax credits constantly being given out to Dan Gilbert and people like that, um, uh, and I'm wondering um, if there was any um, look at that effect on the um, decrease in the effort, if that was something that was considered, or was it just sort of generalized? It's, I have a couple more questions. But Thank that's... you for that helpful question. <laughs> so just so we understand, so the tax effort um, figures that we're talking about, that Charlie Ballard and others are, are drawing attention to, um, are, are basically a, a, a summary statistic. That is to say, you take all the changes in tax rates and, 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 and how the taxes change over time with, uh, with, with changes in the economy, um, uh, they will be reflected in this. So it, it's like countless fiscal policy decisions. So they would include uh, uh, changes in the corporate income tax, they would change, depending on our, And so, so, so among, so, People frequently ask, well, well, what are the key factors that are associated with this decline? And, and I will say, well, it's, it's a whole constellation of, of decisions. Among them, and I will say to, to, to your point, that um, in Michigan's case, the changes in the business taxes did, did have, a, have an impact. But I, 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 I'm appreciative of your, um, of your comment here that, that the term is tax expenditures. That is to say, the, the, the awarding of tax breaks, okay? not, not the changes in the, in the basic business taxes that, that by the way, we, we don't argue against, <laughs> um, but, but, but this question of, of tax breaks, sometimes called loopholes or tax expenditures, sometimes used for business location uh, uh, purposes and, and others. I think we, we, we stand uh, proudly side, shoulder to shoulder with the Mackinac Center on this, <laughs> um, saying that those are, those are, 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 are not well advised um, in, 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 in general. But I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk back here. But we're, what we say is that, that we should not get rid of them, but, but rather take more careful assessment of the consequences of these tax expenditures uh, that the, the impact that they have on funding that's available for schools and other things. Okay, and sometimes you know the, these 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 tax breaks are awarded by by unelected bodies, um, and so I think that is an area. In addition to finding additional sources of revenue, a, a more vigilant attention to the awarding of tax expenditures is probably makes sense for Michigan. Right. Right. Yeah. And I've always I've often thought <clears throat> that um, they should be. People who are benefiting so greatly from these tax breaks should—they want the educated uh, students to college and career-ready students, and um, I think they should pony up. But that's just uh, me. <laughs> um, I did have a. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I had a question too about MIPSERS. Um, so when there was general fund money that was being um, to help support schools, was the MIPSERS coming out of the general fund? And, and when, if it did, when did it shift to the school aid fund? Or did it always come out of the school aid fund? So you're, are you talking about the school districts and, and uh, contributions? 
Well, I, yeah, I was wondering the role of the state in, in um, supporting the MEPSERS over time. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I, I, and, and if it shifted and, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you, do you know, Steve? So be prior to Proposal A, um, part of the state aid. It was part of the school aid fund. Since then, the retirement cost has been the obligation. The <coughs> liability. Um, and then I, I just had one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, um, was the role in, of the tax credits that are um, that are often not spoken about. I've mentioned them before, but the tw 2001 Consolidated Appropriations uh, Act and the Federal Tax Code, which allows um, tax incentives for people who invest in economically depressed urban and rural areas, if they invest in charter schools in those areas, um, they're given, they're allowed to lend out the money and still collect the um, interest on that money, and they get a huge tax credit at the same time, even though it's not a, it's not a, a purchase, it's a, it's a loan. So under this, it came out in 2001, it's been just reauthorized again <coughs> with the latest tax code. It provides for uh, private investment where there's, it's very lucrative for charter schools to get that money, but it's often um, not, like you said, it's not transparent, it's not seen, although it's been written about in the New York, I mean, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, New York Times, whatever, as being this, um, it's a source of revenue that helps charter schools and provides them money for infrastructure. <coughs> um, and it's uh, mostly controlled by hedge fund managers and uh, who, as reported in the Wall Street Journal, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Washington Post that I was just reading, that um, they say investments in charter schools using these tax breaks and codes can double their money in seven years. So it's, it's um, so it's one of those things, I think, when you mentioned that it's sort of we need to have more transparency in the funding of schools, especially when we have an, a surplus of schools more than we need, um, and the, whether that's a good use of taxpayer money. So that I, I, I don't know if you want to comment on it. I just wanted to throw it out there because it seems to not be in the consciousness when we talk about funding. <coughs> this huge uh, tax credit and um, investment scheme that can uh, provide a lot of private funding um, <coughs> already. And it's very lucrative, so is what I, from what I understand, so. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Um, Tiffany, I believe you were next. Thank you for your, um, all of the research that you and your team did voluntarily. Um, it's pretty consistent with the data that I've been getting locally as well as with NASB. One of the things that you pointed out, um, which is very important that I think that we need to have more conversations about is the <coughs> ECE funding. Because when you increase that funding and, and, and increase the quality education for children at an early age, at three and four years old, then, and I wish, you know, that would have been given more detail because it's so impactful. It could really change things in the state. And Michigan gets it right um, in comparison to nationally as far as ECE in a lot of ways, but we definitely have room to do a lot better. And I think that's an area we could take the lead on actually in Michigan. Um, this also made me think about the fact that, you know, the legislative luncheons, the questions that came up um, about funding, I think it would be awesome if we had another legislative lunch where it was a um, kind of a work and learn type of lunch and, and we could have maybe them come in, maybe um, Steve could come in from Wayne Risa and do some educating around funding. For that suggestion. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from board members? Yes, Laura. So 
So as, as a teacher in the classroom, and as a teacher who advocates for students and teachers around the state, this is what I know. I know that, that there are buckets on student staff <coughs> catching water when it rains, while teachers are trying to teach and students are trying to learn. And I know that teachers are setting up GoFundMe accounts for their classroom libraries, and they're using their own paychecks for school supplies. Um, I don't know where the funding will come from, but I do know that this isn't what students need, it's what they deserve. So however it's funded, let's figure it out, and let's figure it out fast, because our students deserve to have equity in the state. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from board members? Seeing none, oh, Dr. Arson. I, could. Um, I, want, I want to repeat something from the beginning, sort of congratulate you for taking up this, this difficult issue. I want to walk back on a moment of high drama earlier about the Mackinac Center. You know, we're going we're gonna to move forward in the context of a, it's not happening, that hasn't been happening. Back when Proposal A passed, there was a grand bargain. There was a grand bargain. The legislature got rid of property tax as a way of funding schools, but nothing to replace it. They had to come up with a solution, and at the time, the 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 um, the, 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 the the Democratic and the um, Republican legislators, their caucuses, nominated six people from each to come together and talk. Kind of discussion that we're not having so much now. Was they they, they, they did their job, and I will say that. Um, that Trustee McMillan, it would be an honor for us to have you. Know, I invite students uh, for my for my doctoral class in in, um, in ed finance. I try to get a variety of points of view into the classroom. Everybody is treated with respect, and I would be honored for you or Trustee Snyder, to come to class to share your views. You've listened to me. I'd be honored, to, our students would be, that we have to have this kind of discussion to move forward in Michigan. My reaction a moment ago was partly triggered by the fact that, you know, we're doing research and we're being attacked by, by and it's very easy to see where it's coming from. A dozen, more than a dozen attack pieces and lots of tweets. Professors don't do that. And we haven't said anything in writing about this. And then I hear back here things that were sort of the same as in the, in the tweets and the report. And I say, OK, um, let's, let's try to move beyond that. Let's not focus on small issues. Let's focus on, on the bigger issues that we confront. We can find common ground there. Businesses of Michigan want us to do that movement there. Citizens of Michigan want us to do that. Find, we can find this turf. We really can. I'm not pessimistic. I think it's coming. It's the current trajectory is unsustainable. It's going to change. And it's going to require people to, to get out of their hardened positions, to be able to talk to folks. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Appreciate you coming today. All right. The next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is an update from the Office of Partnership Districts. The Office of Partnership Districts this morning will provide an overview of the Focused Assistance Support Team, also known as FAST, working with Detroit Public Schools Community District, DPSCD, and also provide an update on the Benton Harbor Area Schools. And joining us um, this morning are Bill Pearson, yeah. School Reform yeah. Officer and Director of the Office of Partnership Districts, as well as Gloria Chapman, the FAST Unit Manager for the Office of Partnership Districts. Um, and this is our monthly presentation to the board, and board action is not required. Here, hold on.
Good morning, Bill, and good morning, Gloria. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> right, I'm passing out, uh, you received a link in the uh, board briefs with our new uh, Office of Partnership Districts um, comprehensive guide, and so I wanted to give you a notebook also. Some people like to come through it that way. So if you have any questions about any of that, you know, you can always email me or call me and I'll be able to answer your questions. But this morning we're here to talk about um, the FAST unit in Detroit, Focused Assistance Support Team, and Gloria is uh, the leader down in the FAST unit. Uh, she has hired three people, and she'll talk about those uh, positions. We have another a fourth person for a curriculum that uh, she has recommended for hire, so we're going to have our whole team in place uh, shortly, and Gloria is going to give you an uh, overview of what's happening in Detroit. And, uh, there's some good things. As you know, there's 56 schools that are partnership district schools in Detroit out of 106, so that's why we have a unit down there. Okay. I may need you to oh, ask to, just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're going to be a, a team yep. here. <laughs> you bet. All right. Thank you. So again, good morning. Thank you so much for um, this opportunity to just kind of share with you um, this new unit. Again, my name is Gloria Chapman. I am the FAST unit manager. And Dr. Pearson um, has been very instrumental in helping us to move this unit forward. Um, I'd also like to say just a, a big thank you right now to Dr. S uh, Superintendent uh, Beatty um, for the Detroit Public Schools Community District and also his Deputy Superintendent Ironetta Wright because they have also been instrumental in welcoming us into the district and leading this work as we try to do some things a little bit different and innovative uh, in support. And finally, but not last, I'd like to just make sure that I thank Wayne Risa because they are also an integral part of the work that we do, uh, Dr. Randy Lipa and also Marquita Hall, who is the manager um, at Wayne Risa and supports a lot of the work that's being done. Okay, so just to give you a brief overview, what you see on the PowerPoint right now is just kind of the setup in terms of the overall organization of our office. So the first part, we have PALS, and they're the Partnership Agreement Liaisons. So within our office, the liaisons are assigned to various districts um, who have partnership schools. We also have our ARE unit, which is our data research, the CTPC, uh, which is critical thinking partners for support with superintendents, and then the FAST unit. So the FAST unit stands for Focus, Assistance, and Support Team. And the goal behind this is simply, if you can go to the next slide for our purpose, is to provide singular intensive support to an identified partnership district. As Dr. Pearson mentioned, Detroit is unique in the sense that it is our largest district. It has 56 schools that are under the partnership district. And originally, I served as the liaison for DPSCD, the lone liaison for DPSCD. And you can't manage unless you have additional supports. So the model previously that we had used was that once a month, we would have a meeting here at, D or at MDE, and all the different departments around MDE would come to the meeting, and they would say, well, you know, have a concern about this. I need help with this. Uh, what are we going to do about this? And then I would take all the concerns back, try to figure something out, and then a month later come back and see which of those issues I had been able to resolve. And then we would have another meeting of, well, now I have this concern. So this model really does the acronym FAST. Our goal is to be more customer support oriented. Again, the district large. Um, so connecting people with the right people within the district, the partnership agreement is 36 months. So they don't have time to try to figure out which person does what work. So our unit has really become the sole carrier and the person's communicating and helping to facilitate that. We want them to bring their concerns, be it from MDE or be it from DPSCD, and then we work to kind of figure out where, where we need to make those connections and move that work fit, uh, forward uh, with them. So we want to eliminate the barriers, obviously be that collaborative partner. Um, we've received a lot of support in terms of people just saying, this is great, you know, MDE is here. Um, so that has been a positive thing. 
So identifying the resources based on need, and again, finally, aligning those resources, and also ensuring that we're not duplicating any services. So the Cadillac Place, if you're not familiar with it, it's formerly known as the OGM Building. And we are fortunate to be located directly across the street from the district offices. Um, so that has been a huge win-win because we're eliminating the need for people to have to move from one place to another. If there's a concern or if there's something we need to do, it's a quick, it can be an email, text, whatever, but also we can do those face-to-face -face kind of things and bring people together to coordinate those services. <coughs> So this is our team. Um, again, myself, Lori Chapman. We have Pamela Bard, special education specialist. And you just heard about all the concerns from the previous presentation. So special ed, when we originally put this together, this is very unique because I did research to figure out where those areas were that MDE could really play a vital role in trying to support. And so special education was, was a key part of that. Uh, we have an analyst, Kenyell Friday, who serves as the, as the analyst for our department. Alphony Gardner, CTE, another thing that DPS is, uh, DPSCD is focused in on is their career technical education. So we have someone for that. And then the last position um, is the curriculum specialist. Everything that we're doing is surrounding about around academics. DPSCD just recently started um, this fall with a brand new curriculum. So the the curriculum specialist, her role, his or her role rather, will be instrumental in kind of bringing together and helping in those other areas that would support that. And we're also going to delve into, because that's, that's part of um, the work that has to be done. So we're looking at things in terms of chronic absenteeism and also the homeless, um, the population in terms of that. And the final one would be child nutrition. Because obviously you have to have students there in order for them to receive the academics. So no matter how great the programs are, we just want to make sure that we're ensuring that students are getting whatever they need to support them in getting to school and taking advantage of their education. So this slide again just kind of goes over, reviews some of those key areas. Um, I have to say um, our special ed person has only been on board less than a month. She's really done a, a, a great job in just trying to work with um, a team at the DPSCD Special Ed Office. So they're working together. We're looking at ways that we can track our progress. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but they have like 1,400 evaluations. Obviously, one person can't <laughs> do 1,400 evaluations. But we can be instrumental in trying to look at ways in which we can help the staff in terms of building their capacity to make sure that they're in compliance. So we're looking at things a little bit differently, but everything is geared toward how do we support those things in terms of ensuring that at the end of this time period, we have been able to really be supportive as the MD, Michigan Department of Education. Cohort one, this is just a little bit of data. Uh, the number of partnership district schools in DPSCD. Right now we have 21 schools that are part of cohort one. We have another 22 in cohort three. And then the final one, we have 13. So again, the team effort, really, really crucial in being able to support the sheer number of schools that we're talking about under the partnership agreement. So the last one is deals with DPSCD, their model. Uh, if you've seen anything that they've done, this was all part of their um, State of the Schools address that was recently held. So the model, I think, really should resonate with the work that we're trying to do as part of the FAST unit. Students rise, we all rise. And at the end it says, be a part of it. This is the work that we want to do in terms of MDE being a part of the 47,772 students who reside and attend Detroit Public Schools Community District. And they're counting on us to be that, that piece to help ensure that the education that they're looking for, that they receive it. And so the be a part of it is not just simply students rise, we all rise. I'd like to change it to just say students rise, all of the students in Michigan rise. So that was fast. <laughs> but you're a fast unit. <laughs> yes, fast unit. <laughs> right. So that being said, um, I don't know if you want to open it up to questions.
Um, comments or questions from board members? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I know partnership districts have certain benchmarks that they have to meet at certain points along the way. Since you're in the district, I assume the district still follows those benchmarks. In other words, these schools are not providing data to you at any different intervals. No. You are there totally to support them as they right. need so that So everything that's written that applies to all the other partnership districts as part of the uh, Office of Partnership District still holds. Okay. Still holds. It's just more that, again, one liaison cannot operate or possibly do the work and support them at the, the level that they need with 56 uh, schools involved. It really does need a more of a, of a team effort. And I did, a, I was in charge of that for a year, and that just was not the most efficient way <coughs> to work this. Thank you. Thank you, Judy and Tom. Thanks for the presentation. I, you know, very much support um, local control person, and I think the state's function really is this kind of thing, it, or at least it, it should be something that support uh, in areas of need. But what what does success look like? <clears throat> so a year from now, if you come before us, how will you tell us? What would it, what would you be able to say as far as if you succeed in your in your role in this fast yes. unit? What will that look like? Right. Specifically. So what I'm asking right now, again, we're we're just getting started with staff coming on board, and so we're looking at our goals right now in terms of how we're going to measure that. So, for example, the special ed, instead of trying to do all 56, we're looking at just cohort one. What are those things? And we're having those discussions right now. And I want to do, in terms of our work, each person involved in it, we will be doing the progress monitoring at intervals. We will put it into a system where we can kind of go back and look and see where are we with this. Is this working? Because at the end of the day, our role would be to come back to the table again and say, this is how well this has worked. This might be something that we might want to try for another district. Um, we might want to reframe it a little bit differently. But yes, we will be doing the progress monitoring. Um, but that data right now, I, we we don't we haven't decided exactly how because I'm just now getting the people into the office. But it's an integral part of, of the work. Yes. And I presented <clears throat> a month ago on um, the 18 month benchmarks for the eight districts that in round one in Detroit was on track, even though we're going to have a 24 month review because of how many schools there are. But they were on track meeting their benchmarks. And those are process and outcome goals. So the academic outcome goals, um, they were, I forget what percentage that we had uh, been successful on increasing, but the process goals, the systems mm. that need to be put in place in Detroit to make it uh, over three, four, or five years that things, good things happen for kids, it's the systems that you know I'm really focusing on. And those systems are, uh, you know, the uh, chronic absenteeism, the number of suspensions. Um, hopefully they'll be able to do some things with facilities and technology. And Dr. Vitti's, you know, I listen to what he says. I go to his presentations and he is on track, I believe, to put things in place so students can be successful. The FAST unit has just been um, organized. It's, mm -hmm. it's a long time coming, but it's here now. Um, there's only a year left on the first round schools, the 21 of them, even though we just got our team in place. So Gloria and I, we've been in conversations about, okay, it might take a little bit longer. We may have to, we'll see how it goes because we have round two also. So 56 minus 21 is 35, so we've got 35 more schools that are in round two that will go into like a fourth year. So there is a lot of work to be done. Um, I have monitored it. It seems to me that Detroit uh, Partnership School District has accepted the FAST unit. Uh, so the FAST unit is getting some respect so that they can work with the um, uh, administrators across the street. Uh, they do know a lot of people in the buildings. Uh, they know some of the uh, principals. I know there's going to be some turnover on principals. There's a lot of work to be done with 56 schools. So it's not just the academic outcomes 
for me, it's the systems that we have to put in place to make Detroit uh, Public School District a viable uh, district where we hopefully can get some students to come back into the district and uh, students will get a, a better education. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's um, been really great, we are housed in the Cadillac place, but the lieutenant governor also has an office on the 14th floor. Um, we have the attorney general. So there are a lot of other governmental agencies housed within this. And so just being in that space right now, people are like, okay, so Michigan Department of Education, it kind of lends itself to, you know, it's like you, you have everybody here. And so we're not that, that distant partner down the road or up the road. We're right here. And so it's also building that community support. Because now, you know, as we have discussions, it's not about, you know, MDE coming in with something. It's like, well, yeah, so how, how can we support this? What is it that you're looking for? What, what are your needs? How does this best work for you? So it really is that collaborative effort. We, like I said, we know that time is precious. Kids are really waiting and need this. And so our whole focus is on, again, how do we make that happen in the best and, and, the, and the, the fastest way possible to support that. All set, Tom? Yep. OK, thank you. Yes, Michelle? Um, uh, I'm from Detroit. And have several of my children have graduated from Detroit public schools, and I think all, just about all of them have gone to Detroit public schools at some point. Um, how do you engage parents in this process? Uh, are they part of the process? Will they be part of the process? Um, and uh, I'm thinking in particular, well, all parents, but I have a particular concern for the special ed parents who sometimes feel, um, uh, you know, the, the, you know, disen disenfranchised or you know, not really as connected. And um, right. so, is there um, a process in this partnership district to engage with the parents? Yes. Yeah, so um, part of that is, you know, just just attending and being present for a lot of different things. So one is the um, Detroit Public School Parent Network. We recent, I recently attended uh, workshops for parents who were coming in to find out more information about the grade three uh, reading law initiative. So just being there in the presence and listening to some of the, their concerns, uh, some of the questions that they're asking, that um, allows me to, you know, relay different information to different departments here and say, well, you know, this is what I'm hearing from parents here in Detroit about this. Maybe they didn't understand this or, you know, so that I think is kind of my level of engagement. I also get phone calls. Uh, people will say, you know, I have a parent here. You know, can you take this? Um, but in terms of that, it really is to connect them with the appropriate people within, within DPSCD. Are there regular meetings that are held? Um, or is that we're so we have what we call our regular partnership agreement meetings that we hold, and we hold them um, in the Fisher Building with uh, Irenetta Wright. Wayne, Wayne Risa is a part of those meetings. So anyone who has signed as a partner, um, we meet. We meet regularly, and we discuss all the issues and concerns at that point. That was only the uh, regular meetings with parents. Oh no, no, no. But DPSCD has a full program, um, a parent engagement, like I said, through their parent network. Um, DPSCD is having their board meeting this afternoon at around 5. Um, I attend those just so, again, to be able to hear and listen firsthand to, you know, what are some of the concerns that parents have. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Any, any other board members? Okay, seeing none. Um, Benton Harbor update. Benton Harbor update. We don't have any slides. MASB worked with the Benton Harbor board two Saturdays ago to go over their roles and responsibilities. I understand three board members attended. Uh, at this time, we have had some meetings um, with respect to what may happen with Benton Harbor, how this is going to roll all July 1st with a cooperative agreement eliminated, and uh, with the governor's office and treasury. Um, it's been uh, those meetings. We haven't had a meeting in two weeks. I'm not sure exactly where we're heading. We've been asked to not say anything. Um, that's really the update. So anything more than that is to share with you, as, as Bill had said, 
that he and I have been invited to meet with um, the governor's team and representatives from Treasury um, in discussion about next steps with Benton Harbor. Um, at this point, we've been asked to keep those, con those conversations confidential and not to release anything publicly. Um, and once we do get the green light to share information publicly, we will communicate directly to the board what we know. But that's our update on Benton Harbor. Michelle, you, yeah, you want yeah, to ask Yeah, I was something? just wondering, if, is, um, in these conversations, are there people from the, from the local school board involved? Or no? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so again, um, I've been asked not to share okay. information okay. about the meeting, so okay. um, I, well, I understand your question. I just can't share that information. Well, do you know when it'll become any idea? Well, Bill, Bill, Bill and I would have liked to have had this um, worked out about two months ago. So we feel a sense of urgency, especially since the school district, the school year is coming to a close. Right. So um, we are hoping for resolution soon. Yes, Lupe and what, then Tiffany. What was said that was going to happen July the 1st? Um, at the end of June, the cooperative agreement is dissolved. Thank you. Welcome. And Tiffany? I'm confused about why we're being kept in the dark. Um, the state board is being kept in the dark about what's going on in Benton Harbor and um, you know we only have one more meeting left before that agreement is supposed to dissolve so I think that we <laughs> so we are we are hoping that we will have information to share with you prior to the next meeting and once we have that information we will communicate it to you in writing we will won't we will not wait till the June meeting We've been asking for information for a while now about Benton Harbor, Harbor for updates, and we haven't gotten them. And I have communicated your desire for information to the governor's office, and the team has told me that um, the conversations are still to remain confidential and information is not ready to be made public. So oh, I don't have any information to share with you at this time. Lupe? So, so this <coughs> cooperative agreement, when it's dissolved, that's the cooperative agreement that Brian started? Yes. Yes, and it was in effect, it was, it was to be in effect for um, three to five years. Um, but in lame duck, the legislators removed the SRO and when they removed the SRO, um, they also removed the cooperative agreement. So come July 1st, the, the authority to run the district will go back to the school board. And the current SRO, sorry, the current CEO will become the superintendent. There will no longer be a CEO in Benton Harbor. It will be a superintendent. And what about the process for that? I know the current CEO is actually shopping himself. He's That's correct. Looking for jobs. So what what's going to happen with them having a superintendent? Have they started a search? Well, he doesn't have, he still has a contract with Benton Harbor. So until that contract is terminated, they would not be looking, or until there's notification that the contract is terminated. Um, it would be premature to start a search for a new superintendent. And because everything is being done in the dark, they don't have time either. I mean, it's a shorter window. But we, yes. That's not really yeah. fair to that district. <laughs> but but I, think, I think if I understand the whole situation, it's that it, it will get turned over to them. We all like local control, but they are currently in need of funding. They can't, I, you know, they're going to need the state's funding, additional monies, and like the golden rule, those who have the gold make the rules. Um, so I think that there's a, that's probably the negotiation. Part of it going on right now is, you know, what's, uh, 
what needs to be in place if you want the funding. I think there would probably be no negotiation if they didn't need any funding. They just go back to local control and. But even still, just because you don't have the gold isn't a good enough excuse. Those children have the right to be educated and that that, that district has the right to know what's going on and what their future is going to be. So right, I, there's probably just discussions with the governors. I mean, with the Treasury or whoever's going to make the decisions on funding. Yeah, but we don't know. Right. Because it's being done in secret. <laughs> it's not transparent <coughs> at all. I'm just curious. Because I guess I feel like what I would do in this situation is do what I can do all the time, right? So this, what you gave us today, is what they're doing right now, correct? This process. No, they're not a partnership district. Okay. They were in a, the only cooperative agreement in the right. state, which would be the board can advise the CEO slash superintendent, and that goes away June 30th. But you had presented us with that. I mean, we had had several presentations on the process mm -hmm. that they are engaged in, correct? What do you mean the process there? Their, the cooperative agreement? Yes. yes. Right. We've but, had, okay. Yeah. So they're still working that out. Yeah, and Dr. Herrera had a four-year contract, and the cooperative agreement was a five-year agreement. So I, my belief is, I mean, I just started in December when this uh, legislation passed. So my belief is that uh, there literally wasn't any thought about Benton Harbor being having a cooperative agreement. It was more about eliminating the SRO and the ability uh, that could, the things that could occur underneath the SRO. So Benton Harbor now, since it was the only cooperative agreement, then we've had to decide, okay, what are we going to do? Those meetings you know, started early, it just has gone on a little bit too long. And there's, I understand there's things going on, but there's still process and path, correct, for them? Yes. Okay, that's all. Yes, thank you. Nikki and Tiffany? Um, communications, how is that going since the last board meeting when we discussed when they were present? I think the communication between Dr. Herrera and the board is at its best place that it has been uh, since um, in March uh, when I was asked to eliminate the cooperative agreement and let the board take over. I think it was March 11th. I said no. The cooperative agreement's in place till June 30th. Um, you know, there was, I think, uh, more friction. At this time, I think that the board is working with Dr. Herrera. Dr. Herrera is trying to work with them. You know, uh, like you said, we do know that uh, he has applied in, in one district, and we'll see what happens, you know, with that. I agree. It's a short period of time if something occurs, but um, that's just where we are. And we don't know why we're there, <laughs> basically. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Once again, as soon as we have information about um, that we can share with the board, we will communicate it to you directly. Um, Gloria, thank you for your presentation on FAST. Appreciate the work that you are doing, you and your team are doing in DPSCD to support the partnership schools. And Bill, thank you for your work in the um, Office of Partnership Districts and your continuing liaison work with Benton Harp. And Gloria, if I can ever be of help, I'm just down the street. Oh. You know, I work at Wayne State, and so if ever I can, I don't know, if there's anything I can do. Thank yeah, you. Follow me. Okay, we'll do it. Next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is a presentation on accountability systems. This is the yeah. first of um, future agenda items on um, activities re related to the design, development, and implementation of the accountability systems required by Public Act 601 of 2018. This presentation this morning is an information item only and requires no board action. Um, at the table this morning um, is Vanessa Kiesler. She is the Deputy Superintendent of the Division of Student Educator, Student, and School Supports, and Chris Janzer, who is our Assistant Director of 
Education, <coughs> Assessment, and Accountability. Welcome this morning. Good morning. Thank you, Sheila. Um, as, as Sheila said, we wanted to spend some time today talking about our accountability systems at a high level, of which there are two. So we have our ESSA compliant accountability system, which includes the parent dashboard and the index system, both of which we've spent over the past two years a pretty substantial amount of time at the board table discussing, um, including monthly updates <coughs> on the dashboard for a while there, and very frequent in, uh, updates on the index, as well as ESSA presentations, I think, again, every month. So we're pretty, pretty well versed in that, possibly. Uh, we certainly spent a lot of time on it as a, as a board and as a department. And then PA 601 is the act that was passed in December of 2018. It is the act that um, requires the implementation of an A to F system. And so we are working on implementation now, which is what is required under the law. We wanted to just step back a little bit and talk about the ESSA timelines briefly, um, just to Remind everybody, because again, it was, even when I was making this presentation with Chris, there's an element of like, when did that happen and what came then? Because time moves fast and we do a lot of things. So let's just kind of reorient ourselves to how this, this happened. Um, in April of 2017 was when we originally submitted the ESSA plan. We went in with the earlier submission. And at that point, as you recall, we submitted actually three possible options for the accountability <laughs> system and said, you know, if the legislature acts, we will move forward with that system. Um, and if they don't, then we will have to come back and say what the system is. Um, in June, the legislature recessed without taking action on A to F. And then, somewhat unsurprisingly to us, in July, U.S. Ed said, we can't, uh, we can't review this plan if you don't tell us what your plan is. You can't tell us three possible plans. Pick one, please. Uh, and so the approach we took at that point was that we knew we needed to submit an ESSA-compliant plan. And we used the term... Um, often a minimally compliant ESSA accountability plan. The significance of that is that over the past decade plus, um, there's been this increasing amount of policy that federal, federal legislation tried to push and states were responding in kind. And one of the things that ESSA gave everybody a chance to do is to think about what we put in the federal plan. So while something might be part of our state plan, if it's not required under the federal ESSA plan, we don't want to put it in there. We don't want to put things in the federal plan that aren't required under federal law. And we don't want the federal law to be the key driver in what we do as a state. That being said, it is a driver, it is a component, and we need to be compliant um, with the requirements of it in order to get the nearly $2 billion in funds that come with these things. So that was, that's kind of how the feds have worked over the previous years is here's money and then here's an in, kind of an increasing number of tasks you need to do to get the money. Um, ESSA certainly backed off some of those tasks, gave more authority back to states. So we wanted to meet what was in ESSA and have an accountability system that would pass their review and get approved, but we didn't want to put things in there that didn't need to be. So we, we looked back at what, what a minimally compliant federal accountability system would be. We spent that summer and fall really negotiating with U.S. Ed and received final approval in November 2017. And so what that system included, and also you all may remember that while we, we, Michigan, considers the dashboard to be a part of our accountability system, as far as the federal government is concerned, they don't. They are like, that's great, you're doing a dashboard, but that is part of how you as a state implement these regulations. We don't. So we always talk about it together. It's in our ESSA plan, but they haven't approved it, or we don't have to run changes to the dashboard through them because that is something we do in support of transparency in the state and to make meaningful accountability. We say meaningful accountability is about transparency and parent judgment. Um, what the feds look at and approve us on and the part that is, the, that is governed by ESSA, that is governed by approval, is this minimally compliant federal accountability system. And without spending the whole day just talking ESSA law, which is, a, you know, just a fascinating read. Uh, anybody's really tired, <laughs> needs to sleep, you know, we can send you in, um, can read it at night. But there's kind of five big things that it requires. Um, one is the federal government has shown absolutely no flexibility or interest at all in this idea that accountability is for all schools in the state with no exemptions. And this is, from their perspective, an equity question, that you have to have people on one system so you can differentiate appropriately about what happens. So we've tried waivers. We've tried different things over time. This is not a point that they're really moving on. Um, will they in the future? Possibly. I mean, I think the, always the question with the federal government, with U.S. Ed, is what will they do in the future? And that's, I, we can't predict that. We can only talk about what has happened with the things we've asked. It's why we continue to ask for waivers when appropriate. We've asked for, I think, four in the context of ESSA under Superintendent Weston's leadership and continuing under Superintendent Alice's leadership. 
Um, we've not been very successful with most of those, but we are asking. We're trying to push on the federal government for the flexibility they'll provide. Um, the other thing that a minimally compliant federal accountability system includes is some sort of overall rating or judgment. They don't care what it is, but you do have to get to some sort of summative score, a number, a letter, a symbol, a, a label, like something overall for the whole school. Uh, that is also a point of differentiation and discussion. It's a point that um, we certainly don't have agreement on. Or the state is not highly supportive of. Some are, some aren't. And in, within other states, this is also this is just a point of um, debate. I would say in federal account or in accountability policy nationally. But the federal government says you have to have it. It's in the law, and it requires that there be certain indicators. So these, I list them out here. You have to have academic achievement, and by that they mean based on assessments aligned to state standards. There is another part of ESSA that talks about what those assessments are. So that's where we get things like the required assessment in grades 3 through 8 and 11 in ELA and math, and assessment of all students, and certain accommodations. There's a series of things that they um, require in terms of assessment. And then once you've, once you've given those assessments to all students, you have to use them in the accountability system. So academic achievement, which is that proficiency level, and then student growth. Um, graduation rates, and we're going to talk about growth more in a minute, so I'm going to hold on that. Graduation rates, English learner progress toward English proficiency. Um, that, again, just to remind everybody, <laughs> was in a separate accountability system for Title III. ESSA moved it into the main accountability system under Title I. So English learner progress, and then at least one measure of school quality and student success. Uh, we have more than one. We have kind of a composite measure, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But states had a lot of latitude in what that was. What they didn't have latitude in is that the first four indicators have to be more than that fifth one. So you can't build a system that's 80% chronic absenteeism, for example. Can I jump in with a question? Sure. Do you mind? So that second bullet point includes some sort of overall rating or judgment. Is that specifically for the bottom 5%? Yeah. And ones that need assistance. So those are the, we'll talk about that too. Those are, those are additional labels that have to be there, but the accountability system that applies to all schools does have to have some sort of summary rating or judgment. And is that summary rating comparing one school to another, or is it just every, I mean, every, theoretically every school could be an 80? Yes, and that's okay. how our, and Chris will get into this more, that's how our index is built okay. currently. Everybody could be 100, everybody could be a 0, everybody could be a 50. It's not a ranking like the top to bottom, which predated it. Okay. You do have to, from that, find the lowest performing, but in theory everybody could be low performing, and then we'd have, you know, everybody could be at 0, for example, which would be a, a bad system, but it could happen so in the system. But have we been doing this? Prior to the lame duck, how have we been doing that second bullet point? How do we fulfill it? Um, again, the presentation gets into more detail, so. Yeah, I'll get into that. Okay. okay. Actually, right now. Right now. Um, so um, if your eyes have not glazed over yet with uh, all of the wonders of ESSA, I'm going to spend the next few slides talking a little bit about the details of our accountability system that is uh, the federally approved system for ESSA. Um, so uh, to Tom's question, uh, the index system uses uh, indices, basically, that range from 0 to 100. Uh, schools get an overall index value um, from 0 to 100, 100 being the top, 0 being the bottom. Uh, we give them to nearly all public schools in the state, of which a subset of those schools are eligible for those federal designations. Those are the uh, CSI, TSI, ATS schools um, that uh, we've talked about before. Um, we also use index values for each of those system components, which Vanessa just uh, briefly touched on. So uh, a school will have an overall index value. If you drill into it in its report, you'll see uh, an index value for its graduation rate or its growth rate or proficiency, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also give index values for each uh, subgroup that exists within that school, uh, as long as there are enough students in that subgroup uh, so if a school has a special education subgroup uh, with uh, 30 or more students in the school, um, we would actually calculate an index value uh, for that subgroup's performance uh, based on all of the components that that subgroup is in. So proficiency, graduation rate, what have you. Um, we, uh, so uh, one of the big differences that is not uh, really promoted heavily in the index system is this percent of target met concept. 
Um, it's a big difference from our old accountability systems where those were more keyed off of a, uh, the school either met the target or it didn't, so very dichotomous, uh, where this is much more of a differentiating, uh, meeting the uh, target to a certain degree. So uh, we still have targets in the system, um, but if a school doesn't reach the target, it's not automatically failing. Um, and so what we use in the little example that we have there is uh, if we have a proficiency target that is 80%, the school doesn't make the target, they have a proficiency rate of 50%, uh, the way the index is calculated is it's that percent of that target um, that is met. So instead of failing it, uh, the school gets credit for achieving 62.5% of that proficiency goal. Um, as I mentioned before, we also, uh, uh, I mean, the main purpose, the, the reason why we really developed this was to uh, determine those federally required designations. Uh, so the CSI schools are the lowest 5%. Uh, I mentioned the TSI, which is Targeted Support and Improvement. Those are schools that have uh, underperforming subgroups. And then ATS stands for Additional Targeted Support. And those are schools that have uh, underperforming subgroups as well, but they're performing at the same level mm -hmm. as a, a bottom five school, basically. And so to add on just a bit to Tom's question, um, we have run the index with the number for everybody two cycles now. Probably why you're thinking we haven't talked a lot about it is that's true. We haven't talked a lot about it in any venue. One of the commitments with ESSA was that accountability isn't about labeling and sanctioning. It's about driving supports. So the CSI, the Comprehensive Support, um, go into partnership districts. TSI, we work on subgroup achievement. We're actually working to do better there in terms of um, our supports to TSI and ATS. And then we use the transparency dashboard as that kind of information to parents. So while we've been compliant and done the index, we haven't been like, everybody go look at everybody's index because we actually want people to pay less attention to that part of the system. We want schools and districts using it to understand where they're at and to drive improvement, but we actually don't want the conversation to be about who was an 80 and who was a 70 all the time. That's not the most useful conversation in Michigan, especially when we see we've had six accountability systems in the last 10 years, and they always identify the same schools as low performing. The problem isn't the measure. The problem is what we're doing about it. The problem is inequitable educational opportunities and outcomes in this state. That's the real problem. That's the real villain. So we want to talk about that, not about I'm an 80 or I'm a green or I'm a whatever. Like, let's leave that alone and move on to, so what? What are we going to do? So that's why, if you're thinking, we haven't heard a lot of talk about index for all schools, that's on purpose, so that we focus more on the important thing at hand, not this, this number. So when we say the lowest 5%, but we don't limit it, the ESSA approved plan does not limit it to 5%, correct? <laughs> we, we do allow some additional schools to have access to resources. Yeah, the, the federal requirement is to identify the lowest performing 5% uh, of schools receiving federal Title I funds. Uh, and the way that we do it in Michigan and other states do this as well is, um, so we do that to be the, uh, fulfill the minimal compliance. Um, but then any other non-Title I uh, funded school uh, that is also performing at that same level, we group them in for those same supports as well. Um, so diving into a little bit more detail, so again, um, we have the components that Vanessa uh, mentioned before, uh, school quality and student success. I don't have broken out here, but uh, as a refresher, that's we look at chronic absenteeism, uh, access to arts, music, and PE. So this is it's essentially a, a staffing ratio to students. Um, we look at uh, access to librarians uh, along the same lines there. Uh, advanced coursework, uh, successful completion of advanced coursework, post-secondary enrollment, I believe that's, that's it. it. Yep. Um, and those are all directly negotiated with stakeholders and are aligned to our top 10 and 10's commitment to a whole child well-rounded education. We don't say those are the only things that represent whole child, but those are measurable things that can go in an accountability system and sending the signal that there is more about a high quality educational experience than simply test scores. And the only other thing I'll add here is, uh, so ESSA still has the requirement that states uh, assess at least 95% of, of their students. Um, it doesn't require that to be part, uh, or I should say, it doesn't require it to be a component of a state's accountability system, but we chose to do that uh, to provide transparency uh, around that. Uh, 
We also disaggregate all of these components uh, by any subgroups that are in the school. Again, as long as those subgroups have at least 30 students. Um, and then to kind of get to that overall index value, uh, Vanessa mentioned a little bit around the edges that uh, the systems are weighted. Um, and what we have here is the way that we have weighted uh, these components in Michigan. So uh, growth gets the most weight, uh, followed pretty closely by proficiency on down the line. Uh, if, for example, we're looking at an elementary school, obviously we're not going to have a graduation rate worth 10% of the index value there. So that missing 10% would get reallocated proportionally uh, to the remaining components in the system. Um, the only other thing I would note here is that that 14% on student quality and our school quality and student success um, is the <coughs> highest by far of factors other than test scores that we've had in an accountability system in Michigan yeah. ever. Ed, yes, maybe danced in close to it, but really in the last 20 years functionally. So it's a very specific, again, that intentionality around let's talk about more than only test scores as outcome measures for schools. <coughs> um, so how do we, uh, we get a lot of questions about student growth uh, from schools. Um, sometimes it's the basic questions on how it's calculated. Uh, a lot of times it's how can we use this uh, to do different things in our districts. Um, so kind of just to go briefly over this. Uh, so we use what is called a student growth percentile in Michigan. We've used it uh, since we transitioned to MSTEP, so five years now. Um, it's an individual level value, so every student in the state will have a, uh, that takes a state assessment will have a student growth percentile calculated for them. Um, the reason that we moved to using these is that they help uh, if we make changes to the tests, uh, which we were going through five years ago, uh, Every it, year, it broke our old uh, growth model where we we would say, well, we can't calculate growth when we change the test and we would need so many years of uh, data in order to do that. Uh, so student growth percentiles are actually one way that um, we can continue to calculate growth even if tests change as long as the student populations are taking the same tests in one year and then taking also maybe a different test, but all students are sort of taking that test again. So it's like comparing student pools, essentially. Um, so Can what I ask these- ask you a question there on that? Yeah. Because this is, gets to the heart of what I talked about several months ago, like how I think, I'm not sure I agree with how we're measuring growth. Um, so how, I understand what you're saying about this and that when you keep changing tests, but isn't there still the fundamental, how do you decide what is proficiency in each of the, you know, I mean, if you have two different tests, I, you know, so that's the variable that you're going to say you can't compare because all of a sudden you're, you're, you're just determining how proficiency. So um, how we set proficiency, how all states, how kind of psychometrics and the standards of measurement say to set, think about proficiency is you have to determine a cut score. And so cut scores are philosophical, right? right. What do that's we mean by how much is enough? Right. In Michigan, we ground that in an idea of career and college ready, what it would take to be ready to move on to the next step and eventually to um, go on to post-secondary outcomes or career in a way that's successful. Um, we do a, there's a whole, we could, again, speaking of presentations you may not ever want to hear, but we could do is how standard setting is conducted. So you gather educators and experts, you talk about how much is that high level, that high bar expectation. Some of you remember we reset cut scores in 2011, even in advance of the test change, because we had set a basic proficiency. What's kind of the minimum that kids need to be able to do? But that was setting expectations too low. So we went through a process of raising the expectations. It's not just how much is enough, but how much helps kids be a higher bar and brought us more on par with things like NAEP. That's why NAEP used to say, you're bad, and we used to say on MEEP, we're great. We went through, it was because the paradigm we were using was what's the amount for basic proficiency. Our proficiency now is, is set on the paradigm of how much do you need to be career and college ready or ready to, to move on the next step, like for a grade, so that eventually you end high school career and college ready. And we set the cut scores based on that. And we've done that, we've used that same paradigm and standard setting procedures since 2011. Even with the M step change, we still set the cut score the same way. It is a science and an art. It's not like um, 
a calculation, like a reliability calculation where there's a formula. But we do use a procedure, and it's all grounded in what is it, when we say we expect high expectations of students, how do you translate that into an actual score on a test? I, I appreciate what you got to do, but people will get fired over this stuff, and okay. it's very subjective. That's, I mean, not very, but I mean, just so that we recognize that you have, I understand, <coughs> when you have dissimilar tests and you keep changing the test, you, you can't compare. But, we, but it doesn't solve the issue necessarily with doing student growth percentile because you are just, it's subjective where you're going to set those cut scores and the proficiency. And, and as long as we recognize and, you know, the brilliant people over there in the Capitol who keep, you know, pushing these uh, top-down solutions that are ridiculous, that it's subjective. I mean, there is an element of art to this, and it's as everybody talks as we about can it like it's, it. everybody talks about it like it's precise. It's as and objective it, as we can make it in the sense that it's not one. I don't set the cut scores. Sheila doesn't set the cut scores. There's a team. There's a process. Again, it's what we're all using. I will never say that it's like not doesn't have some element of subjectivity into it because it includes professional judgment about how much is enough. It includes a lot of people's professional judgment not just two people's. And about somebody's direction does. of growth in order to get to a college, That's right? I mean, all this stuff is just so subjective. From one I mean, so, my goodness. Yeah. Right. I, I know it's... But again, it is as objective as it can know, be given this. And right. the federal, uh, to your point, Tom, uh, federal assessment regulations still do require that we talk about proficiency. I'd be curious to know what we'd do with it if we didn't have proficiency, but even... That's a, that's a philosophical conversation that we don't need to have because at the end of the day, the expectation is that these tests yield an, an, a judgment of proficiency. And so at this present time and since 2011, Michigan has talked about proficiency as a higher bar, a higher level of expectation for Michigan students. It's why our proficiency numbers are lower, uh, that and we need to make improvements in delivery of instructional <laughs> content. But it is, it is why there is a, um, we set a high bar of expectation and it's based in this idea of students really being ready to take the next step after K-12, not a basic level of proficiency. Or do you okay. want to move so on? I can we'll pause for a minute, Cassandra has a question. I think, Michelle, you have a question. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm confused by what you said last, because the first bullet point says this is an individual level student growth. And then what I heard you say, I think, is we actually do this as student pools more like a cohort, right? I was getting to the next kind of step okay. of it, yeah, okay. the aggregation of it. Yeah, so when we report, uh, when schools get their assessment reports um, in the s later in the summer into the fall, each, they'll have, you know, student level results for all of the students in the school, and each of the students will have a student growth percentile um, for them, as long as they had uh, what we call a pretest. so like if they took the test the year prior and then the current year test, we're able to calculate that growth value basically for them. And that... That is, to the individual student, uh, essentially how they've done year over year. Yeah. Chris was just saying that it, everybody has to take the same test in each year. So you can't, in the pre-year, have half take the MEEP and half take the M-STEP and then calculate the student growth. There has to be a common measure to a common measure. Yeah. <laughs> but it is student-level growth. How did I do in third grade? And then how did I do in fourth grade? Um, but again, we can't do it if everybody didn't take the same test. What happens with schools? So you have a, a bullet point in here that you don't punish high achieving students or schools with high achieving students. But what about those schools that have high transient? Um, do you remove those from the overall calculation? In a way, uh, yes. Yeah, so um, there's two parts to that. Yeah, that go, student go could still get a student growth percentile because we track them within the system. So if they move from Dearborn to Livonia and take the test twice, they'd still get a student growth percentile. But when it comes to accountability time. Yeah, um, we will only hold schools accountable for the students that were um, enrolled in that school for what is called a full academic year. Um, and what that means for us is essentially uh, the school reported them in the fall count, the count that happens in February, and then they took the test at the school as well. Um, so if they were, if they missed any of those three things, they're not included in the accountability system. I'm assuming they took the same test at the previous school. Mm -hmm. Well, again, we that's a safe assumption because everybody takes the M-STEP and everybody takes, you know, we don't have a... If they're coming from within Michigan. Yeah. That's true. If yeah. somebody comes from outside of Michigan, they wouldn't have a student growth percentile. Yep. Shall you have questions? Um, actually, um, Cassandra just asked. 
my question. So, hi. Well, I'll, I'll huh? this, just because this is so important, and I appreciate spending time on it. One last thing, on uh, Cassandra just mentioned the punishing, quote unquote, high achieving students. However, like I mentioned, I don't know, several months ago. If you get a, if you have a teacher that is in a high achieving school that has nine, the kids are at ninety five percent, and then at the end of the year they're at eighty five percent, so they've dropped apparently uh, based on test scores anyway. Uh, significantly, that eighty five, if it's above the cut score, they're fine. That teacher achieved one hundred percent growth. Well, you're in the conflating students. school accountability with educator evaluation. Well, so yes, I'm just at the school accountability level, if the target is 80 and you were at 100 and you came to 90, you're right. still above the target. Right. And yeah, I mean, so that. Yes. Yeah, the way this growth works is that a reduction or a um, negative growth by students is viewed as growth. And a, in a poor school, not a poor school, I apologize. A. Um, uh, uh, failing or uh, what, <laughs> whatever it is, I don't think they're failing necessarily either. A lower, you know, that they have lower test scores uh, at twenty percent, and they raise them to thirty percent, fifty percent growth. That could still be failing. All you know, the they could be viewed as failing just because they may not get to ninety or eighty. You know, the cuts to eighty percent. Well, two, uh, in, two things would time. happen for that school. One, whatever the target is, they would have made a greater percentage of the target. So like Chris said, they get they get partial credit, essentially. We used to say, if the target is 50 and you're at 49, no points for you. Now you would get 98% of the points or whatever. Um, the second thing <coughs> is, when you flip over to the 34% that's based on individual student growth, if a school had that many more kids become proficient, all of those kids would have gotten well above their adequate growth percentile, probably, and they would have a really good growth score. So they'd get all the 34 points, or a lot of the 34 points, plus partial credit on the other 29. Um, you are What you are all absolutely right about is there is clearly a correlation between um, <coughs> income and uh, structural disadvantage and a number of things, again, that are outside the measurement system that correlate with how the measurements come up. That is, that is true. We have tried in this system to give as many points and as many advantages to schools that are doing what we really want, which is helping kids get better each year and get better faster the further they are from proficient. I mean, we all want that, right? We all want Michigan students to... And even if we can set aside what's proficient or not, we want kids to be able to read. We want them to be able to do math. We want them to be excited about school, which isn't measured by this at all. But kids who are engaging in intellectually stimulating content in the classroom get more excited about school. So we want these things. We want to give credit to schools who are moving toward that, even if they're not all the way there, not just giving as much credit for coasting along at a high achieving, which may or may not have a lot to do with what you did as a school. You're right about that. So the system isn't perfect, but we've tried to build things in to give more credit for that type of work toward those high outcomes for kids that we want. But when you said the 34%, that they would get all of that 34%, but only if their trajectory is such that they'll get to college and career ready by the end, by 12th grade, right? So they uh, may not get any. I mean, if, it, if it's 10 percentage points, yeah, probably. But I mean, if, it could be growth, but they, are done, they don't get those points in growth because they don't, it's all about trajectory that they'll get to a certain level eventually. So right. The, the way the growth component works is schools would get credit for having so many students counting as growth. So they're on trajectory towards trajectory. that proficiency, right. but right. it doesn't mean that the... They actually, but they could have grown a lot, but if they're not on that tra trajectory, that doesn't count. I mean, they don't get the credit. That, that's, a, that's one of those like hypotheticals that isn't probably very real, so it's hard. Like, if the hypothetical was real, there's... But the trajectories aren't like this. They're, they're just the reasonable amount to move toward it. Right. So it, it would be rare that a kid would have a ton of growth that wasn't captured by their adequate Maybe growth not a percentile. Ton, but it's a decent growth, not, not well, declined. <laughs> what we don't want is a student that we say is growing every year that never gets anywhere. I mean, if you grow one well, centimeter and you need to, you know what I mean? So it's trying to help understand how much is enough and, again, have higher expectations for okay. growth for kids with further to go. I'm, but, I appreciate them. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> I just make one Michelle? quick comment. To me, it's <clears throat> it's rooted in um, not having trust in uh, teachers' professional judgment. That these tests are replacing the professional mm -hmm. judgment of teachers who actually know the kids and spend time with them. And that's sort of to me the rub. Right. Um, so this distrust, or um, uh, and it takes away from their professional uh, assessments, which I think are, you know, they're never nothing's ever perfect, but I think they're a lot better than. 
a test on a certain day with, you know, issues. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We're going to go back to the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Oh, um, I'm so sorry, the, Judy. I'm oh. so sorry, mm. Judy. Just a couple of quick things. Um, you mentioned that participation, Michigan chose to use the additional component of participation. I'm just wondering if at some point Michigan decided, you know what, we don't want to use participation anymore. I assume there's a process that the feds have that we could say, we're not using this one anymore, we're going to use whatever. That yeah. would be what's called the amendment process. The amendment process. Yep. Okay. All right. My other question is those index <clears throat> percentages do show up on the parent dashboard, or do they? No. no. So it's a separate page separate. on my school data. Okay. Uh, there's a link on the parent dashboard <clears throat> that will take someone to the school's index page, but the actual values are not on the parent dashboard. Mm -hmm. And that okay. was purposeful that we did not, we didn't want to conflate the two. Right. Okay. All right. There are many of the same components on the dashboard that are in the index. Again, on purpose, because we want to have um, consistency in between our transparency system and then the high stakes. We just want consistency, like if, where it is. But we don't have any of the judgment or the value, and we try very hard, again, even to keep the messaging about what's the dashboard for versus what the index does. And the index is primarily to help us identify those low-performing schools and direct supports. Even though it does a couple other things according to law, but it is what we use it for is CSI, TSI, and ATS. The targets, these proficiency targets, growth targets, are based on career and college readiness, correct? The targets within the indices, or which targets? Um, the targets you were just talking about, student growth percentiles. So um, student takes a test in third grade, student takes a test in fourth grade. Um, there has to be some sort of target right. uh, to determine whether that student had growth or not. That's based on career proficiency. and college readiness. Yeah, no. proficiency rooted in career and college readiness. The targets that Chris was speaking of, yeah, what's that way? Um, I don't think I have Somewhere one. here, oh. the target met concept, those aren't. Yeah. That is just a percent of the amount of that component that a school needs to attain. And it's set in a somewhat technical way that we can talk about if you want. If that. So yeah, that so yeah. one of the S requirements was states had to have these uh, the feds actually call them long-term goals, not right. targets. Um, and so we had to come up with those. We tied them to the 10 and 10, essentially. But, yeah, they're not rooted in the proficiency cuts. Right. So uh, those are two separate. They are. When we're trying to, to help parents or help ourselves understand yeah. when we're talking about targets or goals, right. that those are really two separate. Um, and the college and career readiness base is that a requirement from the feds, or that's something Michigan determined that they were going to follow? That is a really on? good question. It's a, it's murky. So, and I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna have to just do a tiny little bit of history on this. Um, NCLB just said set proficiency, and so there was clear incentive for every state to set basic proficiency. And then there was kind of the emerging conversation around is basic really enough, and we still lag behind, and PISA, and NAEP, and we still, you know, what are we going to do? Um, and at the same time, Race to the Top ran. And Race to the Top didn't say you have to set career and college ready cuts, but they did say you have to have high quality standards that measure career and college readiness. So infusing this idea of career and college readiness and higher standards, because again, they were calling out states we know what you did was you just set kind of low low standards, low expectations. That wasn't the intent. So Race to the Top pushed it. We obviously didn't win Race to the Top, but certainly the conversation, what we did, we did work to not just win Race to the Top. I think we also had a good conversation internally. I don't, was anybody on the board? Michelle, you I were. I was in the legislature. Yeah. We had a good conversation about, you know, do we want low expectations for Michigan students? No. You know, so what are we going to do about that? Um, and then ESEA Flex, again, kept pushing this idea of high, like, high quality standards align, you know, career and college ready. And ESSA retains this idea of you have to have standards, they have to be high quality, they have to be high expectations. Nowhere does anybody say your proficiency cut has to be career and college ready per se, but there is this kind of, if the standards are all about high expectations and then the proficiency is supposed to measure those standards, so it's, it's almost like a derived idea, and it's how all states are setting their cuts now. Um, yeah, can I just said it many times, I'll say it again. Mm -hmm. I cringe every mm -hmm. time we use the words career and college oh, ready. Because mm -hmm. it doesn't measure career or college readiness. Um, so I, 
I understand that there's it's based on something that exists in the world, but that label is just awful. Well, I think we have a good conversation to have about what we want to do oh. with that as a concept. So maybe that isn't the right concept moving forward. Maybe there's a different paradigm that we need to think about. And so that'll be a good conversation to have with Dr. Rice as he begins. You know, I, I think you guys are right in that there is a conceptual underpinning here, and we pick what the conceptual underpinning is, and then we derive things from it. So if it's not career and college ready, then what? And then we can think about what that means in terms of the system implications. All of, I mean, not just within assessment. It's actually kind of broad scale. We would think about what that means. It's a good conversation. Well, one, one more quick one. Well, it may not be quick. Okay, eighth <laughs> graders this year took PSAT. They did. How are we measuring growth? Because they took MSTEP last year. Well, it's like Chris said, because it's not test dependent, we can actually do a student growth percentile because everybody took MSTEP in seventh grade and everybody's taking PSAT in eighth grade. But it's not the same test. Uh, SGPs don't require that it be the same test year over year because it's right. about where you were in the pool and where you ended up in the pool as long as you're in the same, as long as everybody took the same test. It's just like MSTEP to SAT as well. Yeah. It's, this, it's the pool of students that are taking MSTEP, and then we're looking at the same pool of students that took MSTEP in seventh grade that are now taking the PSAT in eighth grade. And, and obviously, we're going to look at those eighth grade growth scores pretty closely to see whether we do think it had an impact. I, I believe it's going to have an impact, but that's me. So Growth is based on achieving some kind of career and college ready, and it's very subjective in both of those pools. Growth, the student growth percentile at its core is really based on where you were, your scale score really, in not just that bar. So remember, everything's scale scored, and then we set a bar, and so below this is not proficient, above this is, but everybody has a continuous scale score. It's really based off scale score. So if you were a, I'm not even getting my numbers right, but a 2100 on the I don't think that's a real number, uh, on the 7th grade M step, and then you were a 1,300 on the PSAT, but that's good. You know, it's about the scale score. So someone, it's not all based in proficiency. What Chris is talking about is then the adequate growth percentile. So everybody gets a growth score. I know this gets really technical. <laughs> everybody gets a growth score based on how they performed. And then we say, is that enough to get you to that, that idea of high expectations, which, again, we define as career and college ready. And taking Cassandra's point that maybe that's the wrong paradigm for the future. Or the label. It or the label. It might just be the label. Sure. Yeah. I mean, again, I think these are all really good and important conversations to have. Thanks. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. If there aren't any other comments or questions, we'll go back to the presentation. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, yeah. Um, actually, I think we can go to the next one. I kind of talked about that real quick. Uh, so getting back to the identification, I skip to the table that we have here. Um, so the CSI, TSI, ATS here, um, this table just kind of explains uh, when we do it, who provides the supports, uh, the exit criteria, and when we're doing it next. Um, so the, the lowest five, the comprehensive support and improvement schools, that's that top row. We do that every three years. We did that uh, a year ago. Um, so we're going to do it again. Uh, it says 1920. That's, ba that's the, the data source here. Um, so accountability typically follows the assessment window six to eight months after it happens. So uh, just to give you a rough idea there. So off of next spring's assessment. Yep. Uh, the TSI, Targeted Support and Improvement Schools, we do every year. So we just did a, um, 60 or so of these uh, back in February or March, I believe it was. Um, this is where that uh, ESSA flexibility, uh, the local control piece of ESSA comes into play, where essentially the responsibility of the depart of state departments everywhere is really just to identify those schools, and then the supports and the exiting is left up to the local districts. States are approaching this differently. I know we're working through what we can do to provide some sort of level of support for these schools. Uh, additional targeted, um, this happens every other CSI cycle, so every six years. Um, we just did these this year. Actually, we need to update the slide. Um, and so we'll be doing it again in 22, 23, I think, yeah. if my math is right. Um, and again, 
these are schools with uh, subgroups that are performing at the same level as a bottom five school. Um, so the next slide that I have here is just a very high level uh, sort of a development schedule. Um, this looks at the current index system and, and the length of time it took us to develop it. Um, we had extensive stakeholder engagement and feedback. Um, this was part of ESSA. Uh, so that, this started um, going all the way back to summer 2015 when uh, Superintendent Whiston had a few uh, groups going on of external stakeholders talk not just about accountability but other things like uh, I think there was a finance group and assessment. assessment. Um, so going back to then where that sort of formed the basis of our start of all of our then ESSA work, um, that went through the following fall. Um, system design started after the stakeholder feedback pretty much ended. Um, and so this is where we sort of took the ideas generated from those uh, groups and started uh, putting those ideas to paper, trying to figure out sort of the technical rules around things. Um, and that essentially took the better part of a year to design a completely brand new accountability system. Uh, system development and testing, this is uh, when you think about the uh, folks like me that are in the windowless rooms typing on our <laughs> keyboards frantically and coding, that's what system development and testing is. We're making sure that the system behaves the way that we thought it would be behaving, so doing a lot of validation, modeling, um, and programming, essentially. <coughs> um, that took a year, um, and that is that, again, when you're building a new system, that is really time intensive. It's building data structures and and then all the programming and the uh, validation of it. And then we released our first results uh, last spring. I think it was March, um, essentially. And we just share this um, on two points. One, one major learning that we've had here, there's, there's were times in my tenure here where we developed accountability systems fast without a lot of stakeholder engagement and released them. That does not go well. That is a bad plan. Uh, you don't have buy-in, it surprises people, and people then can't use it for improvement because they're too busy being surprised by it. We also want the voices of people who are going to be impacted by it to be as involved in the system as, as we can, again, knowing that there's guardrails that we have to all work with it. And then the second is just making sure it's right before you release it and having good development and design, just, it takes time. So again, we just want to share that while it is possible for Chris to go to his windowless room and design a system and launch it in an Excel spreadsheet in a relatively short amount of time, that's not good policy practice, and it, it, it makes it harder for us to actually use accountability to help support schools. So we try hard to use the lessons we've learned the hard way uh, to make this more positive um, for the whole educational enterprise. Um, so with that in mind, uh, what we have here is uh, just some things that we've thought about in trying to tackle 601, the A to F system. Um, we're thinking it's going to require similar resources and scheduling. Um, we're assuming less stakeholder engagement than ESSA. Um, we've started design work already looking at the legislation. Um, so we're kind of putting that legislation to paper, trying to figure out options and all of that. Um, again, this is an abbreviated schedule. Um, and so we're hoping to be on path for release sometime next year, about this time, maybe a little earlier. Um, one of the things, again, that I think uh, among many things that we still need to determine is the sequence of running two systems with limited resources. The, the legislation didn't provide us with more people or more money to do this, um, and we still have our obligations to run our federal system. And our transparency dashboard. And the dashboard, yep. Mm -hmm. So we are, I think the big takeaway is we are taking the legislation. Um, Chris's team has, like you said, the design work. They've started working through, working toward those business rules of this will happen, this, these are the data flows. We want to use similar types of, like the same group of kids in both systems. So it's not these were the kids that we're accountable for on in the index, and then these are the kids in A to F. That would be too confusing for schools. So look, and also efficiencies for the staff, looking for ways to use business rules and programming where we can. Um, and then, yeah, thinking about how we get this out and how we message to systems and, and make sure, um, make sure again, schools have the information they need to make sense of the information being provided to them by us. And that includes all of the things that we share with schools. We want to support our schools and districts 
um, ultimately in support of our students. So that's where we are. And yeah, so uh, the last slide here is uh, this is a link to the accountability unit's uh, homepage, if you will. Um, we don't have any A to F information on there right now, um, but if you are dying to know more about the index and the nitty gritty ins and outs of all that, we have everything from technical business rules on there uh, to uh, high level like parent guides basically to the index reports um, that'll that shows like a screen and calls out different things on that um, so that's at that link if you're if you are interested in visiting it and back to you superintendent comments questions uh, just uh -huh. real quick uh, I just want to go on record saying that I am not sure I don't uh, necessarily approve of how we're doing student growth and how it's being calculated this idea of not punishing high achieving students or schools, I don't support a system that inherently punishes schools and teachers that have students from socioeconomic backgrounds that, you know, may, uh, the system of growth designed here, uh, that they're punished based on this system of growth. I think if it was a different system of growth and there was some growth there, then they would be rewarded. Instead, I, you know, I think that, I think the incentives may be wrong. I think there's a lot of uh, unintended consequences. Teachers will decide to go into the potentially the schools that are easy. You know, the growth is easier because they could even kids could decline and it's they're still counted as growth. And you know, the schools will not be judged differently. So I am I'm not sure. Uh, you know, you get I don't know when you're going to come back to us, but um, I would encourage you to come back more rather than less if you're making decisions that I think we may need to weigh in on. Uh, that's my own. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions or comments? Okay. Thank you to both Chris and Vanessa for um, taking a complex concept and topic and breaking it into um, an understandable presentation and being responsive to all of the questions and concerns and mm -hmm. spending the time engaging in the conversation with us because I think there was some really good conversation around this topic today. So thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on to our next item, which is discussion regarding criteria for grant programs. Um, we have two grant criteria, criteria for school. So I'll start with, are there any um, questions that board members have for criteria for school climate transformation grant? General, what's going on? I'm going to ask Diane to come forward. Um, and so Diane can uh, provide a brief synopsis of the School Climate <coughs> Transformation Grant. And I'm going to allow Amy to do that. <laughs> and Amy. Amy, <laughs> correct, please. Yes. Di Hi. Diane is yes. the Director of Health and Nutrition Services, and would you please introduce Amy? And this is Amy Eleni. She's our supervisor of the School Health and Safety Unit, which houses the School Climate Transformation Grant. So over the past five years, and actually we're in the fifth year of the previous grant um, through the Department of Education, we have a grant to partner with My Blissey, um, who is Steve Good Goodman's um, shop that does a lot of the work around PBIS, Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports. So basically this is just a very targeted grant to work with districts who actually apply to us for technical assistance. And then my Blissey's people actually provide the technical assistance to roll out PBIS. For the first um, five-year grant, we pushed it out. Our goal, our benchmark was for 90 districts in the state. I know that we met and actually um, exceeded that number. I don't know exactly off the top of my head what number that is. Um, but it's basically to just do PBIS with fidelity in those, des in those districts with a cohort um, that requires a lot of training. And all of that has been developed by my Blissey, so we part work partner with them to provide the training and technical assistance. Is that helpful, Nikki? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions on this grant? All right, seeing none, thank you very much, yep. Diane and Amy. <laughs> we'll move to the criteria for the 2018-2023 Michigan Charter School Program Grant. Question from board members. Cassandra. So I will have more to say on this when we get to ready to vote on it, but I just have a clarifying question about what I'm seeing in front of me. And it says that um, applicants' requests for funding can support certain things, and one of them is hiring and compensating 
During the applicant's planning, one or more of the following teachers, school leaders, and specialized instructional support personnel. Do school leaders include um, employees of the management company or the grantee themselves? Okay, so I'm going to ask Paula Daniels, who is the director of the Office of Educator Supports, as well as Tammy Hatfield, to come to the table and to be able to respond to that question, please. And Paula, introduce Tammy, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Paula Daniels, and I'm the director of the Office of Educational Supports. And we have Tammy Hatfield, who is the manager of our um, our public school academies unit. Sorry, <laughs> senior moment there. Okay. <laughs> Yes, they can use a portion of the grant money, prorated only until they're eligible for state aid funding to do some design and really specific work. So in the budget, they have to provide the number of hours, what they'll be doing, and it has to really articulate and align to what they're doing. So there's a small fee for that uh, school leader. Usually the school leader is employed by the management company. We do have some that are in the MIPSER system. Okay, thank you. I will reserve my comments. Okay. Any other questions from board members? Okay. Thank you very much to Paula and Tammy. All right, so um, it is now 12 07. We'll um, adjourn for lunch and reconvene at 1 o'clock. Oh. Come back, Josh. Not today. I think they next can't run <laughs> next door. Yeah. That's just that way. Yeah. yeah. It's only right. done like in two hours at a time. Right? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just so busy right now. No, I'm giving you a hard time. I want to stay for a whole one of these, but every time.